Chapter 1 Ottawa, July 1910 Hazel Hughes had too much time on her hands, a condition which even the sweet matron of Ottawa admitted was good for no one. Not a single good thing could come from her having too little to do and too much time to do it in. She'd been a widow for fifteen years, and at the beginning of that time, she'd been able to occupy herself by being the best mother a teenage boy could ever want. But now that teenage boy was grown and off saving the world as a member of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, and she was drifting, drifting in a way that might be dangerous for Ottawa, or worse, for all of Canada. She stared out the window, watching the bustling street in front of the huge stone house she'd occupied since the day she'd married her late husband. Everyone she could see had a purpose. Everyone but her. She shook her head. She wasn't going to wallow, because she wasn't a wallower. Instead, she'd go to the church and join in the ladies' luncheon. She'd give counsel to the young ladies of the congregation and teach them how to stitch the perfect quilt block. They were making quilts for the poor, a project she'd organized in a desperate attempt to fill her empty life. As she was leaving to make the ten-minute walk to the church, she encountered the postman, who had a letter for her from her son, her only child, who was serving as a Mountie in the West. She tore open the letter, desperate for news from him. Reading his words, she pictured him sitting atop his horse in his uniform, his red serge jacket looking majestic. Dear Mom, I hope this letter finds you well. Are you still doing your work with the church? I know how important it is to you that the poor in Ottawa have what they need to keep them warm through the winter and fed throughout the entire year. I do hope you find what you are looking for in the good works you do. As for me, I'm still very thankful that I've found my calling here in the West, though there are times I miss your cooking fiercely. Do you have any idea how long it's been since I've had good chicken and dumplings? Or just some fluffy pancakes? We Mounties take turns cooking for each other, but none of us have the skill in the kitchen you have. I know you're going to tell me to find a wife, but truthfully, there just aren't enough women here to go around, and a man who stays in one town all the time has a much better chance at courting a pretty lady. No, it seems I'm doomed to bachelorhood. I hate to cut this short, but it's time for my rounds. I'm going out with Kendall Jameson today. He's our newest man at the post, and he needs someone to show him the ropes. I happen to be very familiar with the ropes, so it's my duty to ride with him. Sending you love from rainy British Columbia. Theodore. Hazel hugged the letter to her, dashed a tear from her eye, and marched onward toward the church. There were young ladies there who needed to learn how to make a difference in the world, and today, she was the woman to show them. Jessica Sanderson looked around the room full of young ladies, thinking all of them had a purpose, well, everyone but her. Her dear friend Joanne was a teacher, working at disciplining and tutoring young minds. Her friend Lisa was known as the kind soul of the congregation. She visited the elderly and the sick. Only she and Joanne knew the truth about Lisa that she was as sassy as she was sweet when no one was looking. Jess sighed. She needed a purpose for herself. She was finished with school, but she had no desire to be a teacher like Joanne, though she was every bit as smart. She'd thought working at the bank would make her feel fulfilled, but it didn't. Why did she feel so adrift? She glanced over at Mrs. Hazel Hughes, whom all the young ladies referred to as Miss Hazel. She couldn't look at the kindly woman without embarrassment. Her only son, Theodore, had been Jess's crush from the moment Jess knew boys were different than girls. She'd embarrassed herself by following him around quite often. She was sure he'd complained to his mother about her being a pest, though he'd never come right out and called her one to her face. Miss Hazel rushed to Jess's side. I've just received a letter from Teddy. Jess blushed. Miss Hazel had to know what a nuisance she'd made of herself. Why else would she seek her out to tell her she'd gotten a letter? That's nice. How is he? Had she kept her voice casual enough? Would Miss Hazel realize that her heart still belonged to her absent son? He's doing well. He says he misses my cooking. Miss Hazel sighed. I miss him so. It doesn't feel right that I'm all alone in that big house. Jess smiled sweetly. Maybe Miss Hazel didn't know after all. She just seemed lonely. You should take in boarders, Miss Hazel. That would give you something to do. Miss Hazel sighed. 
I don't want to take in borders. I want adventure. I want excitement. She laughed softly to herself. You know, it's too bad old ladies can't join the Mounties, you're not old. At least Jess didn't think she was old. She wasn't good at judging age when someone was past forty or so. And she knew Miss Hazel had to be at least that old, because Theodore was seven years her senior, and she was an old maid at twenty-three. Maybe you should travel. Maybe I should, but I couldn't do it alone. Miss Hazel stared off into space for a moment, watching the young ladies in the room flitting around, some of them acting so superior to others. Some of them sitting alone, wishing desperately someone would speak to them. You should go with me, Jess Sanderson, your parents don't need you. They have your brothers and their wives to keep them company. Let's travel the world. I, for a moment Jess was stunned. How did one respond to a request like that? A slow smile crossed her face. There is nothing I would enjoy more. When are we leaving? The words were out before she could stop them, and surely she would have if she'd had time, wouldn't she? How much notice will you need to give at the bank? Miss Hazel asked, her eyes lighting up with excitement. Jess bit her lip, thinking for a moment, two weeks would be more than enough time to hire someone to take my place. Today's Friday. We'll leave two weeks from Monday. Miss Hazel clapped her hands together excitedly. We'll take a train to Boston, and then we'll go south by boat from there. Do you get seasick? Jess shrugged, feeling as if the world was spinning out of her control, but she didn't care. She wanted nothing more than to see the world. I've never been on a boat to find out. Nor have I. It's high time the two of us were on a boat, don't you think? Miss Hazel seemed to have a light bulb within her lit. Jess couldn't remember ever seeing her so happy, except maybe on the day that Theodore had finished his Mounty training. She'd been so proud. When she'd received the official letter from Regina that his training was complete, she'd cried and cried. Her son was serving his country in a way that made her very proud. I supposed it is. We'll go talk to your parents as soon as this silly luncheon is over. You've the afternoon off? Miss Hazel asked. Yes, the bank is closed for Dominion Day. Why did we schedule this luncheon for Dominion Day? Miss Hazel asked, seeming confused for a moment. You chose the date, Miss Hazel. Everyone was afraid to argue with you. Jess shrugged. Miss Hazel was a force to be reckoned with, and Jess was no exception. Well, no matter. We'll speak to your parents after our stitching is done, and then we'll begin planning our trip. You do have some fancy party dresses appropriate for the trip, don't you? Jess shook her head. I wear my best clothes to church every week. I don't have anything fancier. Then we'll find a seamstress tomorrow, and we'll get that taken care of, won't we? For a moment, Jess had to wonder if she was already aboard the ship Miss Hazel planned to book them on and had been washed overboard by the huge waves. It made as much sense as standing beside the woman she'd always hoped would one day be her mother-in-law as she planned a trip around the world. I suppose we will. The rest of the luncheon was a blur. Jess did as she was told, but she thought of nothing but her nervousness at telling her family of the plans she and Miss Hazel had made. How would they feel about her leaving the country without them? It was a good thing she'd known Miss Hazel since the day she was born, or they wouldn't even entertain the idea of her leaving. A few hours later, Jess sat nervously on the sofa beside Miss Hazel. Her mother had served tea for their unexpected guest, and both her parents were sipping the tea from the two armchairs, which were perpendicular to the couch, obviously wondering why they had been asked down. She knew Miss Hazel wanted her to begin the conversation, but she just couldn't. Finally, her father set down his empty teacup. The silence was obviously too much for him. To what do we owe this pleasure, Mrs. Hughes? Well, since your daughter obviously isn't going to spit it out, I'm going to have to, aren't I? Miss Hazel shook her head at Jess, who wanted to sink into the sofa and disappear. Jess and I were talking at the luncheon today and we've decided we should take a world tour. Do you realize that neither of us has ever even been on a boat? Father shook his head at that. Why is Jess going with you? She has a perfectly good job here in Ottawa, because I need a traveling companion. 
Jess doesn't really have any strings keeping her from doing fun, exciting things. She should see the world before she settles down and has babies. Don't you agree, Mrs. Sanderson? To Jess's surprise, her mother simply said, I do agree. Father looked at mother. You do? Mother nodded. I always wanted to see the world, but we married so young, I feel as if I missed something. I want my daughter to have what I missed. I will want letters every week, of course, because I shall worry otherwise, but yes, I think she should go. She reached over and took Jess's hand squeezing it. You have the fun I always felt like I was meant to have. Thank you, Jess whispered to her mother. She rarely stood up to father or had an opinion that could bother him, so it felt good to be supported. Father seemed flabbergasted for a moment, but then he shrugged. I suppose if your mother feels so strongly about it, you should go. It was all Jess could do not to stand up and dance around the room. She was going to travel around the world. A train, and a ship, even if they never got past Boston, she'd never been on a train. Thank you, father. Don't make me regret it by marrying someone who isn't even civilized. Jess shook her head emphatically. I won't. I promise. Two weeks later, Jess stood on the train platform saying goodbye to her parents. She was in a new traveling dress that Miss Hazel had insisted she needed. It was more fashionable than anything she'd ever worn, but it fit perfectly. Having someone other than her mother make her clothes for her had been a very new experience. I shall miss you both, Jess said with a tear in her eye. But I promise I will have the most marvelous time, and I will write every single week. Father looked for a moment like he was about to change his mind, but he shook his head. Be sure you do write to your mother. Jess embraced them both, Miss Hazel bouncing excitedly beside her. Jess wasn't sure a lady of Miss Hazel's mature years should be bouncing like a toddler, but she didn't question it. She was going to travel and see the world. Why would she question anything? They walked to the sleeping car Miss Hazel had procured for them, and Jess looked at the top bunk. I presume I'll be sleeping up there? Miss Hazel surprised her. If you don't mind, I've always wanted to sleep up high off the floor. I believe it would feel as if I was floating on a cloud. Who doesn't want to float on a cloud? She scampered up the ladder, with a speed and agility, that astonished Jess. Jess shook her head. This trip was going to be the most exciting thing she ever did in her life. She could feel it. After changing trains in Maine, they headed south, toward Boston. Jess couldn't stop looking out the window. We're in a different country, Miss Hazel. We certainly are. I think we'll spend a week in Boston. We can shop for new clothes, go see a play or two, meet a handsome young man, Miss Hazel winked at Jess, who blushed. I don't know about meeting a handsome young man. Why? Is there a beau I don't know about back in Ottawa? Miss Hazel tilted her head to one side, as if considering. I've never heard of you setting your cap for a young man. Jess shrugged. I never really have, not since I was old enough for it to matter anyway. She couldn't lie to Miss Hazel, but it was hard to have this conversation, because the only man she'd ever really been silly about was her son. Hmm, there's something you're not telling me, but it's too glorious a day for me to worry about that. In a few hours, we're going to be in Boston. I can't begin to express how excited I am. The first thing we'll do upon our arrival is find out what plays are showing. Yes, Miss Hazel, when a hired driver in a motor car pulled up in front of the Parker House Hotel, where Miss Hazel had booked them rooms for the night, Jess's stomach was in knots. The hotel was so grand. A telegraph operator's daughter shouldn't be allowed to stay in such a magnificent place. Her eyes were wide as the driver helped her down from the automobile and gave her luggage to a bellboy who was positioned out front of the hotel. Have a nice day, miss. Jess followed Miss Hazel inside. The older woman seemed to know exactly where she was going and had no qualms whatsoever about staying there, though Jess knew she'd not traveled before, either. Soon they were in their room, all the way up on the fifth floor. Jess stood peering out the window, astonished at how small everyone looked. This room is so high up. Miss Hazel nodded, obviously excited to have reached their first destination. I shall use the telephone to find out what plays are in town, 
and we will decide where to go from there. Jess was still staring out the window when Miss Hazel finished her call, we're going to see the Duke's Dilemma at the Forsyth Theater. The operator told me it's filled with Spanish intrigue, and that sounds like something we have to see while we're in Boston. All right, Jess told her. She didn't care what they did. She'd someday be able to tell her children that she'd seen a play in Boston. She'd stayed on the fifth floor of a hotel in Boston. Well, if she ever found a man who could measure up to her Theodore. She frowned. At least at home, she would occasionally see a man in a bright red coat, and she'd know he was a mounted that might know Theodore, now her only connection to him was his mother. She took a deep breath. She was going to have fun and stop wallowing in her loneliness. After dinner in the hotel's restaurant, they walked the eight blocks to the Forsyth Theater. It was a beautiful night, though a little warmer than Miss Hazel wanted. She kept fanning her face with her hand and mumbled something about blasted hot flashes under her breath. As they waited in the lobby of the theater for the doors to open, Miss Hazel struck up a conversation with a woman who was close to her age. I've never been to Boston before, have you? The woman, a striking blonde with beautiful green eyes, nodded. I have lived very close to Boston my entire life. My hometown, Beckham, is just a 30-minute train ride from here. Do you come here to see plays often? Jess asked, very curious about how things were done in the USA. She knew their countries had similar backgrounds, and geographically were close, but how similar were their daily lives? The blonde shook her head. No, I wish I did. I have a matchmaking business, and I spend most of my time working or raising children. My husband insisted we needed to get away for a while, though. The blonde man beside her put his arm around her waist, as if he seemed to think she was in danger. The door should be opening any minute, Elizabeth. A matchmaking business? Miss Hazel asked. I didn't realize it was the custom to have a formal matchmaker here in the States. Elizabeth laughed. No, it's not at all. I match women from the East up, with lonely men in the West. Mail-order brides are my business. Miss Hazel's eyes widened. And people you've matched are happy? Oh, yes. I haven't failed yet. Jess stood quietly watching as Miss Hazel seemed to light up from within, the same way she had at the church when she'd announced they were going to travel the world. She was almost nervous at what the older woman must be thinking. Finally, Miss Hazel looked at Jess. Jessica Sanderson, you're about to become my son's mail-order bride and my daughter-in-law. Chapter 2 Jess stared at Miss Hazel, in shock. You can't just decide to marry me off, to Theodore. I really don't think he'd appreciate your meddling. I'm not meddling. I'm helping him. He misses my cooking. We'll go home, and I'll teach you how to fix all of his favorite dishes. Then I'll write him a letter and tell him we're coming to see him. Elizabeth frowned. You really must get a man's permission before you bring him a bride. She shook her head. I'm sorry, I should introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth Tandy. I'm Hazel Hughes. My son is a Mountie, fighting in the West. Men outnumber women all over Canada, but it's so much worse out West. I'll feel much better about him being gone once I know that he's happily married and has three decent meals a day. Miss Hazel, this is not a good idea. Oh, you hush. You've never been in love. What do you know? Miss Hazel rubbed her hands together eagerly. We're taking the first train back to Ottawa tomorrow. I'm sure Teddy will thank us both. But, Jess needed to find a stronger argument. She loved Theodore so much but if he had no feelings for her, she didn't want to be married to him. Miss Hazel frowned, would it help if I got his permission? Yes. That would help a great deal. Jess shook her head. You can't control his life now that he's thirty, and a Mountie besides. Mrs. Tandy shook her head. I think you're making a mistake, but as long as he agrees to it, you're fine. Yes, I am fine. Thank you for the brilliant idea, Mrs. Tandy. You're welcome. The couple went into the theater to find their seats, and they were separated then. Jess had a feeling her life would never be the same. Just over a week after they left Ottawa, 
Jess, and Miss Hazel returned. On the journey back, Miss Hazel had been very specific with what the plan was. Jess would stay with her, learn everything she needed to learn to be a good wife to Theodore, and they would leave as soon as they had permission to come from Theodore. She'd argued that she needed to live with her parents, but Hazel had flat out refused. They had been in favor of her being Miss Hazel's traveling companion, and they'd travel together in another couple of weeks. It was close to three weeks later when the letter arrived from Theodore saying that he would be happy for Jess to come. Jess couldn't believe it. She'd been sure Theodore had no feelings for her. He probably couldn't even remember who she was. No matter, he'd agreed to marry her, and she was thrilled. In two days, they'd be on a train and headed to British Columbia. Jess had clothes strewn all over her room the following day when her friends Joanne and Lisa arrived. Joanne leaned against the wall, while Lisa stretched out on Jess's bed. I don't want you to go, Lisa said. I want you to stay here so we can be friends forever. Jess frowned at her friend. We're going to be friends forever whether I live here or in British Columbia. All right every week. Lisa threw one of Jess's pillows at her head. It won't be the same. Joanne had a smile. I'll still be here, Lisa. We'll have fun together. Lisa looked for another soft projectile, but came up with only a shoe. She deliberately threw it a foot to the left of Jess's head, because though she wanted to express her frustration, she couldn't bear to hurt her friend. Jess glared at Lisa. Stop throwing my possessions. But you're leaving me, Jess walked over to sit on the bed beside Lisa, patting her friend's good arm. Lisa had been deprived of oxygen at birth and she had something called cerebral palsy. Her left arm didn't work right all the time, and she walked with a bit of a limp. I am leaving. But part of me will always be in your heart. You can write to me anytime. And I believe that someday, they'll have telephone lines that stretch all the way across Canada, so we'll be able to talk to each other when that happens. Still won't be the same, Lisa said, a tear coursing down her cheek. No, it won't, but you'll have Joanne and your parents. You'll still have a life that is full. I'll miss you terribly. Lisa gave a half-smile. That's what I needed to hear. That you'll miss me too. Jess nodded. How could I not? You and Joanne are the sisters I've always wished for. I'll miss you both every day. But, I want to marry and have babies. This is the way for me to do that. Joanne walked over and sat on Lisa's other side. We'll endeavor to have so much fun that Jess with regret leaving, because we'll send her letters full of all the things we're doing without her. Jess held her hand palm up for Lisa's. Friends forever. Lisa nodded, resting her head on Jess's shoulder for a moment. Friends forever. She reached over and grasped Joanne's hand as well. Friends who will be together and rubbing Jess's nose in it forever. Joanne laughed. I'll miss you, Jess. Theodore and his small group of Mounties were stationed in Squirrel Ridge Junction, but they served many villages in the area. They took turns riding out to different parts of their vast territory, and one of the men usually stayed at the base so they could keep the peace. Their base consisted of five small homes and an office building with a jail. The train stopped right there in Squirrel Ridge Junction, a town consisting of mostly trappers and farmers. Theodore and his friend Joel had gone to the academy together, and they were thrilled to be working there together. Joel was in charge of the post, which meant he was often stuck with office duty, which suited Theodore just fine. He liked to be outdoors, riding around the countryside. His horse was his only companion when he was out in the field. Theodore wasn't thrilled that he was the one in the office, but his mother and her traveling companion were due to arrive on the afternoon train. He was going to bunk with Joel while they were in town, and give the ladies his cabin. It wasn't much, but it was better than sleeping in a tent. He was looking forward to a few days of his mother fussing over him and some good home-cooked meals. She'd never come to see him before, and the idea of her cooking was enough to make bunking with Joel worth it. When he heard the train whistle, he plopped his hat atop his head and strode out of the office, toward the station. It had been several years since he'd seen his mother and he was ready. It was time. When he spotted her, the girl beside her looked a little familiar, but he couldn't figure out at first where he knew her from. 
and then it hit him. Jessica Sanderson. She was the girl who had followed him home from school one day. She was, well as nice as Jessica was, she'd always been so busy mooning over him that it had made him uncomfortable. Why was she here? His mother spotted him and hurried toward him. She moved like a woman half her age and size, and he always worried he was going to have to remember every bit of his first aid training when he saw her run that way. He opened his arms wide, hugging her tight. I missed you, Mom. Oh, Shaw. You missed my cooking. He laughed softly. That too. His eyes went to Jess, standing a bit behind his mother. I'm going to stay with Joel, so you and Jessica can have my cabin. You remember Jess? she asked, excitedly. I'm so glad. I brought her to be your bride. There is a preacher in town, isn't there? She looked around her as if she expected a preacher to pop his head up at any moment. Theodore stared at his mother for a moment, before shaking his head adamantly. I'm not marrying her. I don't know her at all, and what I do know of her is not something I want to be married to. It's not happening, so you can just take her right back to Ottawa. Theodore. Don't you be rude. Me? You don't think it's rude to bring me a bride with absolutely no notice? He took a deep breath, trying his best not to lose his temper. She was his mother, and he loved her. Why? You told me how lonely you were. I never said any such thing. She frowned at him. I can read between the lines. You said that you missed my cooking, and you'd marry if there were women available. That I did not say. I said I knew you'd tell me to marry, but there were no women available. Those are two very different things. Maybe so, but I taught Jess to make all your favorite meals. She's a lovely young lady, and I think if you'll take the time to get to know her, you'll adore her as much as I do. She shrugged, I always figured that if I could choose my own daughter-in-law, I'd choose her. But, Mom, you don't get to choose your own daughter-in-law. Of all the crazy schemes you've come up with, this is by far the worst. I'm not marrying someone just because you think I should. Jess couldn't stand there another minute. She was humiliated. She walked over to Theodore and offered her hand. I see you remember me. Your mother told me you'd agreed for me to come. I thought you wanted to marry me. I'm very sorry for the confusion. Theodore frowned. I did agree for you to come, as her traveling companion. Nothing was ever said about marriage. Jess couldn't believe it. How could Miss Hazel do this to her? Well, you know what? If you feel that strongly about not marrying me, then I'll just take the next train home to Ottawa. I'm sorry to have inconvenienced you this way. She walked over to a bench on the boardwalk in front of a small store, plopping her bottom onto it. When does the next train come through? Theodore removed his hat and ran his fingers through his hair. Thursday. Well, that's perfect then, isn't it? It's Thursday. It is Thursday, and the train that would pick you up just left. Jess sighed. I guess we're stuck with each other for the next week then. I guess we are. The whole time they were getting settled into the cabin, Jess said nothing to Miss Hazel. As much as she loved the woman, she'd crossed a line. Jess had traveled for days thinking she was going to meet the man she loved and spend the rest of her life with him. He'd had no idea he was expected to marry her. She sighed as she started a fire in the stove. She was sure there was another bachelor in the small town who would marry her, but she couldn't bear to spend the rest of her life living that close to Theodore, knowing he felt nothing for her. She put a pot onto the stove and added the chicken so it could boil. Theodore had the ingredients for chicken and dumplings, his favorite meal, on hand so his mother could cook. She'd help. That was why she'd learned to make it, after all. Miss Hazel walked up behind Jess and put her hand on her arm. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Jess shrugged. I'll survive. I didn't know you were in love with him. Jess closed her eyes, embarrassed beyond belief. Was it so obvious? Do you think he knew? Oh, no. He wouldn't have known, but he's a man, and he doesn't know you like I do. If I'd asked you to marry someone else, would you have agreed? 
Jess shook her head. How can I marry someone else when I've been in love with Theodore since I was ten years old? It's just not possible. Miss Hazel pulled her down into a hug. Jess was tall for a woman, and Miss Hazel wasn't. Her back hurt a little by the time the older woman released her, but the hug had felt good. Motherly. For all of her years expecting to spend the rest of her life a spinster, she'd never felt as completely alone in the world as she had since she'd set foot in Squirrel Ridge Junction. I'm so sorry I've hurt you so. I'll make it right. I promise. Jess laughed. How on earth do you think you can make this right? He doesn't love me, and he's angry with me for being here. Of course you can't make it right. I'll do my best. Don't. Please. Don't try to throw us together, don't try to make him love me. If he can't see what a gem I am, then he's not worthy of my affection. Jess said the words lightly, trying to sound as if she was joking. The tear trickling down her cheek gave her away, though. All right, dear. I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. Theodore stood outside the door to his own cabin, feeling like a heel. He'd hurt Jess's feelings, and he knew it. He hadn't meant to, but the shock of his mother bringing him a bride, well, it was too much even for him to bear. Now he had to be extra kind to Jessica, to keep from feeling even worse. He knocked twice on the door, and his mother opened it wide. Teddy, come in. Jess was just finishing up supper. She made your favorite. He winced. His mother was going to keep trying to throw them together. He could feel it. That was the last thing he needed. Thank you for cooking for me, Jessica. Please, call me Jess. No one calls me Jessica, except my mother when she's angry with me. Her eyes didn't meet his, but she didn't seem upset. That was a good start. Okay, Jess, supper smells wonderful. He'd brought over a couple of extra chairs from the office, so there would be a place for them all to sit. One night while you're here, you're going to have to cook for all of my friends, Mom. We all miss home cooking, and their moms cook for me when they visit. I'm not sure I'm going to feel up to it. I feel a cold coming on. I'm sure Jess would do it though. Mom stood, rubbing the back of her hand against her forehead. In fact, I think I'm going to go and rest. You two have supper without me. She walked into the small bedroom and shut the door, leaving Theodore alone with Jess. I, I'm sorry I was rude to you earlier, he said, hating that they were alone. He wanted to throttle his mother but he was an officer of the law, and that would never do. It's all right. In your shoes, I have no idea what I would have said. Please know that I had no part in her scheme. I truly thought you knew that I was coming. Theodore watched her as she put the food on the table, feeling worse by the minute. I believe you. Mother is, well, she doesn't seem to follow the same rules that the rest of the world does. She didn't mean to hurt either one of us. Oh, I've known Miss Hazel forever, and I absolutely adore her. I know she wouldn't hurt me for anything. Jess sat down and put her napkin in her lap. Would you mind saying grace for us, Mr. Hughes? He nodded, bowing his head and saying a simple prayer. He took a bite of his chicken and dumplings before saying another word. These are wonderful. They're even better than Mom's, but don't tell her I said that. Oh, of course not. She thinks she taught me to make chicken and dumplings, but the truth is I've been making them for years. He grinned. You surprise me. Oh? How so? I remember you as a little girl with your hair in braids and scabs on your elbows. You followed me home from school one day, and you didn't seem to even know where you were. You were a little bit spooky. She laughed gaily, trying to hide the hurt. I'm sorry. I was daydreaming and just ended up following you, I guess. That was a strange day. It was. He didn't bother to mention how many times he'd caught her following him at recess, so what do you do back in Ottawa? Until your mother talked me into quitting my job so we could travel the world together, I was a teller at a bank. Now I suppose I'm unemployed, but I did get to see Boston. Mom wrote that she was going to travel the world with a companion, and the next thing I knew, she was coming here. 
why didn't you continue traveling, he asked, taking another big bite of the dumplings. He hadn't been lying when he said they were better than his mother's. He'd never eaten anything that tasted quite so wonderful. She smiled, well, we got as far as Boston, and we were both staying in a hotel for the first time in our lives. We were way up on the fifth story, and the view was amazing. Anyway, your mom decided we needed to go to a play, and she called to see what was in town. So we went to see a play. While we were waiting to be seated, she struck up a conversation with a stranger. I've asked her to stop doing that. In this modern age, you never know what can happen. Maybe it was safe to do that when she was a girl, but it scares me nowadays. And in Boston of all places. I know. Anyway, this stranger told Miss Hazel that she matches up women from the East with men from the West and sends them off to marry as mail-order brides. The next thing I knew, she told me I was going to marry you. I tried to talk her out of it. Mrs. Tandy tried to talk her out of it. But you know your mother. She wouldn't listen. I finally told her I'd agree if she got your permission, which is why I thought you knew. I wondered why she worded her letter so strangely. She said, do I have your permission to bring my traveling companion with me when I come to visit you? Of course I said yes, I'm not an ogre. Theodore shook his head. We've both been fooled by her. Your mother is a force to be reckoned with. Everyone is afraid of her. Jess took a sip of her water. They all kowtow to her. Not you. He could see that her character was made of stronger stuff than that. She was, special. No, not me. Though I did let her talk me into coming out here with her. Maybe between the two of us, we can convince her to give up and let us go about the rest of our lives unencumbered by a spouse. He smiled. Maybe I should introduce you to my friends. Five Mounties live here, not just one. That sounds good to me. I don't fancy the idea of going back to Ottawa. She knew she'd never marry anyone else, but if he wanted to introduce her around, she wouldn't say no. Chapter 3 Jess woke the following morning and felt the sadness wash over her in waves. She was close to Theodore once again, but he'd rejected her. Proximity didn't matter at all. He had no desire to even be around her, let alone marry her. She got out of bed, washed her face, and dressed quickly by the thin light coming in through the closed drapes. She hoped she hadn't slept too late, because she needed to get breakfast made. She went into the kitchen and started a fire in the stove, mixing up enough pancake batter to feed a small army. As soon as the batter was mixed, she removed bacon from the icebox, and she sliced off piece after piece. If she had the bacon done before anyone was there for breakfast, she could easily make a few pancakes at a time. She had been certain the night before that Miss Hazel wasn't really sick, and had only wanted her to be alone with Theodore, but now she wondered. The older woman was always awake and fidgeting in the kitchen before she woke, putting the coffee on, she made the first four pancakes, because she didn't want anyone to be hungry for a moment longer than usual, and flipped them onto a plate, putting a plate over the top to keep them warm. Thirty minutes later, she had a small mountain of pancakes, and was relieved to hear a knock at the door. She didn't want to keep cooking and have no one arrive. Theodore had said the night before that all the men would be there for breakfast. She rushed to the door, averting her eyes, and blushing when it was Theodore. Would she ever get over the embarrassment of thinking he actually wanted to marry her, when he'd really only agreed for her to come as his mother's traveling companion? Good morning, she said as brightly as she could. You're up. Good. We're ready for breakfast any time you are. He rubbed his stomach. I know it sounds like we're only happy you're here for food, and that's not true, but we're very glad you're feeding us. Jess smiled at him. Breakfast is ready. Come in. Theodore waved his hand, and four men appeared behind him, were awfully eager to have a breakfast without broken eggshells in it. She opened the door wide and watched as five men traipsed into the room. They were all quite young, around Theodore's age, give or take a few years. All of them wore the bright red coats of their profession, but each one removed the brown mounty hat he wore as he stepped into the small house. Jess frowned as she watched them. The cabin wasn't really big enough for five Mounties and two ladies, 
but she figured they'd make it work. Hurrying to the stove, she served up the pancakes, bacon, and coffee she'd made. I thought you might want pancakes this morning. Theodore had mentioned how much he'd missed his mother's pancakes and how he couldn't wait for her to cook breakfast at least six times at supper the night before. What gave you that idea? Theodore asked with a sly grin. Jess was startled to hear herself laugh. She thought she'd never be comfortable around the man, but here she was, laughing at his jokes. Maybe there was hope for her after all. Three of the men automatically sat on the floor as she gave them their plates and coffee. They didn't complain, and acted as if they would sit anywhere for the food Jess was providing for them. After she'd served the last man, Theodore nodded to the remaining chair. Sit and eat with us. You're not here to serve us, though we're all mighty happy you're cooking for us. Jess took a seat hesitantly. It felt strange to eat surrounded by men in uniform. After one of the men said a quick prayer for all of them, Jess turned to Theodore. Will you introduce me to your friends, please? Yes, of course. He gestured to the man beside him. This is Joel, he's the commanding officer of our unit. We were in the same training class at the academy. Then he pointed to the three men on the floor, sitting in a row with their backs against the wall. On the left is Kendall, the newest man in our division. In the middle is Elijah. And on the right is Nolan. Be careful of Nolan. He eats three times what the rest of us do, and he's still always hungry. Jess eyed the lean man curiously. That can't be true. Nolan shrugged. I'm afraid it's very true, miss. I can't seem to stop eating. He held his empty plate out to her. In fact, Jess laughed softly, taking the plate and walking to the stove where she piled another four pancakes on it. Don't get up. Do you want butter and syrup? Please. She carried his plate back to him, noting that everyone else had only eaten a few bites. Let me know if you want more. These are the best flapjacks I've ever tasted, Elijah told her, a curl hanging over his forehead. Jess couldn't help but wonder if he knew how young the curl made him look. Thank you. I do enjoy cooking. Jess would happily cook for all of them the entire week. If you'll tell me what you want for supper tonight, I'll get started on that as soon as I can. She planned to give the cabin a good scrubbing while she was there, simply because it needed it. The men each seemed to be considering her words. I'd like pot roast, Theodore finally said. That okay with you men? And a lot of it. Nolan said enthusiastically. He seemed to realize how rude he'd sounded and bowed his head for a moment. Please, miss. Jess laughed. Call me Jess. My full name is Jessica, but Jess is what my older brother called me when I was little, and it just kind of stuck. Nolan smiled. I like it. Thank you for making such a wonderful breakfast, Jess. Is there more by any chance? She realized all the men were looking at her expectantly, and she smiled, got to her feet, and served them all more of the pancakes. She'd have to make a few more for Miss Hazel when she finally emerged from Theodore's bedroom. The men chatted about what their plans were for the day. Joel looked at Theodore. Are you still planning on staying in town and me taking your rounds while your mother is in town? Theodore nodded. I prefer to be on rounds, but I can't leave my mother and the lovely Jessica by themselves. Lovely? Did he just call me lovely? You only think my food is lovely, she murmured under her breath. Theodore looked at Jess. Do you think I'm blind? Of course, I think you're lovely. You always have been. Even when you were a little girl skulking around the playground, you were pretty. We all talked about how beautiful you'd be. Why haven't you married yet? Jess blushed, feeling all five sets of mounty eyes on her. I've had a few men interested in being my suitors, but... No one ever was quite who I was looking for. She ate her last bite of pancake without meeting Theodore's eyes and walked to the basin. She poured hot water from the kettle on the stove into the basin and began washing the dishes. The men continued to talk behind her, and she could feel Theodore's eyes on her, but she just kept washing the dishes. She didn't really want to have a discussion with him about why she was unmarried. He was the reason. He would always be the reason. 
The men brought her their plates one by one, each of them thanking her for the meal. Theodore was last, and he lingered for a moment after the other men had left. Would you allow me to show you around town later? Her heart screamed yes, but she couldn't. Not just yet. She had to make sure he wasn't toying with her affections. What about your mother? I'm sure mom's all right. She's just not used to the kind of travel she's experienced in the past few weeks. She'll need a couple of days to recuperate, and we should stay out of her way. Why, why should we stay out of her way? Theodore frowned. He didn't understand what she was asking. Why do you want to take me for a walk? You've made it very clear you're not interested in having anything to do with me. That was before I tried your cooking, he said with a laugh. When she didn't grin in response, he sighed heavily. When you got here, I recognized you as a girl I didn't have exactly fond memories of. And then mom announced she'd brought you here to marry me. Even if I had fond memories of you, I would have been angry at her presumption. I was rude, and I'd like to make it up to you by taking you for a walk. She stared at the dishes for a moment before finally nodding. All right. I'll walk with you. She didn't know if she was agreeing to a walk around the town or the chance for him to court her, but either way, she'd have memories. Memories she could live her whole lifetime on. I take an hour for lunch at noon every day. If lunch is ready when I get here, we could walk after. Why don't I make up a picnic for the three of us? Jess asked softly. Three of us? Well, if my mother really wants to come, she can, but I'd rather spend a little time alone with you. Her eyes flew to his. You would? He nodded. I definitely would. It's not every day we get a beautiful young lady here in town. And you'd like to start a flirtation before you put me on a train and send me back from whence I came? Something like that. Theodore picked his hat up from the table and walked to the door, stopping to turn and look at her for a moment, standing there washing dishes at his basin in his tiny little cabin. Why did seeing her there feel so good? When Jess realized he was watching her, she turned to give him a questioning look. He tipped his hat to her and left, closing the door firmly behind him. Jess smiled a little. She knew Miss Hazel hadn't had a chance to talk to him, so maybe he just liked her. She put her hand over her heart to still it, sopping herself because it was covered in soapy water. No matter. Dresses dried. She all but danced about as she finished the dishes up and cooked one more plate of pancakes for Miss Hazel. She'd start on the floors in a little while. She was going for a walk and a picnic with Theodore Hughes, the only man she would ever love. Theodore hung his hat on the hook in the Mountie office, taking his seat at the desk and frowning at the stack of paperwork waiting for him. One of the Mounties always stayed in the office, both because they wanted someone on hand for an emergency, but also because there was always paperwork. They all dreaded it. Theodore leaned back in his chair, his eyes gazing out the window for a moment. Jessica Sanderson. Who would have ever thought he could want to spend time alone with Jessica? Not him, he smiled to himself. Her cooking was far superior to any he'd ever eaten. Her manners were impeccable. And she was a beauty. Every time he looked at her, his heart beat faster. It had been all he could do not to kiss her while she'd done his dishes. Who kissed a woman while she was washing dishes with his mother just in the next room? Not him. But he'd wanted to. Oh, how he'd wanted to. When Miss Hazel finally emerged an hour after all the men had left, Jess looked at her in surprise. It's half past eight, Miss Hazel. Are you feeling all right? I'm just travel weary, child. What made me think I could make it all the way around the world? Jess studied the older woman, but she didn't look tired. No, she looked like she'd been awake for a long time. How many chapters did you get read before you came out? Miss Hazel's eyes danced mischievously. Only three. The men sure seemed to like your pancakes. You didn't think to save me any, did you? Jess shook her head at the older woman's deviousness. On the work table, next to the stove. Would you mind washing your own dishes? I want to give this cabin a good spring cleaning before we go. I don't mind a bit. I don't believe I'll help with the spring cleaning though. 
I think Theodore will be more impressed when he realizes you did it all yourself. Theodore doesn't want to keep me, Miss Hazel. He's made that very clear. Maybe he has, but I heard him ask you to go with him on a walk today. And you're making a picnic. He was quite clear that he didn't want me to go. Jess frowned. Were you eavesdropping? Of course I was. I also could see on his face that he really wanted to kiss you. Why, I think if I hadn't been in just the next room, and you hadn't had your hands soaking in soapy water, he'd have swept you into his arms and kissed you right there and then. He would not have. We're not courting. He's just showing me around town. The blush on Jess's face belied her words. She'd felt something between them as well, and it hadn't felt one-sided as it usually did. Oh, Shah. What are you wearing for the picnic? You have that beautiful white day dress with the blue ribbon running along the bodice and the hem. That would be perfect, don't you think? Oh, but I wanted to wear that when I, Jess stopped talked, turning her back to the older woman as she fussed with using the dust cloth in her hand to chase away a couple of cobwebs. When you married my teddy? But I thought the wedding was off? Why have a pretty dress if you're not going to wear it? Jess was glad she couldn't see Miss Hazel's face, because she could hear the self-satisfaction in her voice. I think I'll wear my mint green day dress. It's brand new, and it seems just the thing to wear for a picnic. And I have a bonnet to match. I'm going to wash all the bedding later, so I'll have to hunt for a clean quilt for us to sit on. She walked to the door, still keeping her back to the older woman, and shook out her cloth. Would you like me to fix your lunch as well? I would adore that. In fact, I think I'm going to let you do the cleaning and cooking by yourself. I want to know what's going to happen to that wicked Mr. Darcy. Miss Hazel had a huge grin on her face as she tucked into her breakfast. Whether or not Jess knew it, she was about to be her daughter-in-law. Nothing would make her happier, except maybe grandbabies, and they'd only be a matter of time. Who didn't want grandbabies, after all? Chapter 4 Jess cooked up a big ham, and she used that for ham sandwiches for the picnic. There was enough left that she could make some lovely omelettes for breakfast for all the men the next morning. She left a sandwich with some of her potato salad in the middle of the table as she packed up a basket with lunch. It was obviously a basket used for marketing, but she knew it would work for a picnic just as well. She called out as she left, Your lunch is on the table, Miss Hazel. I put a pile of mending out for you as well. That's fine, dear. We'll do the mending together. Jess shook her head. As much as she loved Miss Hazel and knew the older woman loved to take care of her boy, she was shouldering all the work. Jess liked to work, so it didn't bother her, but it did surprise her that Miss Hazel was shirking. She walked toward the Mountie office and enjoyed the quiet of the street. There were few people out and about. It was a quiet little town, and just the opposite of what she was used to in Ottawa, but it was a welcome change. Jess stood for a moment outside the door to the office, wondering if she should just walk in, but she decided it was a place of business. A knock would be conspicuous and out of place. She opened the door to find Theodore leaning over his work, his dark hair falling into his eyes. He needed a haircut. She cleared her throat. Constable Hughes? She felt like she was being too formal when she referred to him that way, but he hadn't yet asked her to call him Theodore, or Teddy. She always thought of him as Theodore, but Miss Hazel insisted upon calling him Teddy. She couldn't help but wonder which he would prefer from a woman he had almost kissed at a dish basin. Theodore looked up, his green eyes flashing. Jessica. Thank you for coming to rescue me from my paperwork. I'm happy to do it. She watched as he took his hat off the wall and plopped it atop his head. Let's go for a quick tour of town, and then we'll have a picnic in the meadow behind the mercantile. I'd like nothing more, she said softly. Her voice sounded breathless to her, and she bit her lip. She couldn't sound that way to him. It might make him realize just how much she cared, and of all things in the world she wanted, that was at the very bottom of the list, unless he told her he cared, and then she could blurt the words right out. Theodore offered his arm, something he'd rarely done with a lady. Back in Ottawa, he'd had a young lady he squired around for a while, 
but she was easily forgotten when he decided to be a Mountie. He was excited to show Jess the small town he'd grown to love. No one is quite sure how Squirrel Ridge Junction got its name, but you must admit, it is unusual, Jess nodded, a smile playing at her lips. She took the proffered arm, walking with him. It is unusual, but I tend to like unusual things. Is that so? She nodded. I've always insisted on working for a living, though I didn't need to. I like to contribute to my parents' household. You were a bank teller? Isn't that what you said? Yes, I was. I never much liked it, except for paydays. When I could take money to my father to make his life easier, it always brought a smile to my face. He smiled at that. I didn't know women enjoyed that sort of thing, I thought they didn't feel the need to be independent. I'm not most women. Jess let him show her the mercantile and the small church. How many people live in the area? Do you have mostly farmers? He nodded. The town built up when the railroad came through, and there were a few farmers who stayed. It's barely enough people to support the mercantile, but the men here are good people. All hard workers. Is there a saloon? She hadn't seen one, which surprised her a bit. In her mind, men who lived in the West were drinkers. Not here in town, there's one the next town over, which is about an hour's ride from here. Why? Do you need some whiskey? She laughed. Not particularly. I just had in my head that men out West were big drinkers. I don't know where the idea came from. I don't either. He led her out behind the main street and took the blanket she was holding over her free arm, spreading it on the ground. He sank onto the quilt, feeling a bit strange. He hadn't been on a picnic in ages. Weren't picnics for small children? Jess pulled their plates and the ham sandwiches from the basket. She added a small amount of the potato salad she'd covered with cheesecloth to each plate and poured them each a glass of lemonade from a jar she'd found. I made enough ham for breakfast tomorrow as well. He smiled. You're going to spoil us, and we're all going to be very sad when you're gone. Usually we just eat each other's cooking. We all hate to cook, so the meals are, well, they're not always palatable. He took a big bite of his sandwich and groaned softly. You made fresh bread? She shrugged. I had a little time this morning. She didn't tell him she'd also scrubbed down his walls and floors, and she planned to do all the laundry she could find the next day. She hated the idea that he had to do everything for himself. It's wonderful. Did you make just one loaf? Jess shook her head. If I didn't know better, I'd think you were starving to death. Not at all. But, I do get hungry for things I miss. Not one of us knows how to make bread, so we usually buy it from the mercantile, but it's a couple of days old before they even get it there. Fresh bread is a welcome taste, I'll be sure to make it again while I'm here. She took a bite of her own sandwich, watching him, but trying to do it without him noticing. How often do you do paperwork? Not too often. Usually Joel volunteers to do it, because he's the commander of our small group, and it's easier if he just does it. If one of us does it, then he has to spend a few minutes reading over it anyway. Do you prefer paperwork or dealing with people? Oh, I much prefer to do rounds. We have a wide territory, and with five of us, we can just barely make it everywhere in a week. He took a bite of her potato salad, his eyes closing with pleasure. Where did you learn to cook? She shrugged. My mother taught me. I've always enjoyed playing with recipes and I improved some of my mom's. I have never tasted better cooking. I didn't think there was a woman alive who could cook better than mom. You can. Thank you. She spent a couple of weeks teaching me to make your favorite things before we came west, but I just kept making everything the way I always have. I hope that's all right. He frowned at the reminder that she'd been brought to him as his bride. I think your cooking is wonderful. You don't need to change anything you do. Not for me. She continued eating, not certain how to respond to that. Did you always want to be a Mountie? She finally asked. Not until my father died. Do you remember what happened to him? She shook her head. 
No, I remember when it happened, but not what happened. I was really young. Well, he'd gone on a business trip to the west, not far from where we are, actually. While he was out, he was murdered. His killer was never caught, because there were too few Mounties back then. I decided I would become a Mountie so no one else would ever have to wonder who killed their father. She reached out and took his hand, before she realized what she was doing. I'm so sorry, Constable Hughes. Why are you so formal with me? You know my name. She shrugged. You've never asked me to use your name. Your mother always calls you Teddy, and everyone else calls you Theodore. I didn't know which name you preferred. I've always preferred everyone call me Theodore, except my mother. I like her special nickname for me. Perhaps you would use my nickname as well? And call me Teddy? Her eyes met his, and she felt like they were having another moment. A special one like they'd had while she washed dishes that morning. She looked away shyly. I'd like that. I would too. He looked down at her hand, which was still holding his, and he squeezed hers. May I call you Jessica? I know you prefer Jess, but... That would be nice. Jess seems so boyish to me, but it has always been my name. He reached out and tilted her chin up, so she was looking into his eyes. Maybe while you're here, we could get to know each other better. I think you're very special, Jessica. Because I can cook, she asked. She knew it was rude of her to come right out and ask that way, but she'd learned at a young age that if she wanted to know the truth about something, the only way to get it was to ask. He smiled at that. Well, that is a bonus, but no. I like you. You didn't yell at me when I was so rude to you at the station. You still made me a delicious supper. You cooked for my friends this morning and acted like you didn't mind. You're a worker, and I value that in a woman. You have to be willing to do your share and then some to survive in the West. And, well, you're the prettiest girl I've ever met. I don't want to throw away the chance I have to get to know you better just to thwart my mother's plans. Would you do that? Try to thwart my mother's plans? Yes, I definitely would. She always acts like she knows what's best for me, and even if she does, I don't want her to think she's right. Does that make any sense at all? Jess nodded, a smile on her face. It's like my older brother, who thinks he knows everything about everything. I hate it when he's right, and I'll often do something to make it so he can't possibly be right, just so he'll be wrong for a change. You're as stubborn as I am, aren't you? Definitely. I was determined not to even speak to you for the whole week after the incident at the train station, but I realized your mother was to blame for that, not you. She shrugged. Why punish myself by staying angry, when I can easily forgive and have a good week visiting a region I never dreamed I'd be able to travel to, so we're agreed, he asked. Agreed? May I court you until you get on the train to go back to Ottawa, Jessica? I want to get to know you better and see if we might suit. Despite the fact that it would make my mother very happy if we were to marry. Jessica laughed. Yes, I'd like that very much. You see, I like your mother, and I wouldn't mind if she was happy. He grunted. Well, I like her too, and I want her to be happy, but, I don't want her to be right. I completely understand, which is a bit frightening for me to admit. I like you even more for agreeing with me, Jessica. Jess smiled at him, surprised they were in complete agreement. She reached into the basket and pulled out something else she'd made. You had blackberry bushes in back of the house. So I made muffins. He took the muffin from her hand, surprised that it was still a bit warm. When he bit into it, it seemed to melt in his mouth. You can use every berry out there if you'll keep making muffins like this. I thought I'd make some jam before I leave as well. I will be eternally grateful for anything you can make that will stay good for when you're gone. Even the mercantile's bread would be good with jam on it. Then I'll make sure I do that. I'll make more muffins too though. I can make you a lunch for work tomorrow. Or I can come to the cabin to eat lunch tomorrow. Would that be all right? She nodded. Yes, that would be fine. We should have a little spat while you're there for lunch, to make your mother think her plan will never come to fruition. 
would you? Theodore asked, his eyes wide. I would love that. I was joking. What would we fight about? I don't know. I could tell you that I don't like you wasting my berries and jam when I like muffins better. She laughed, shaking her head. Would she believe it? Who knows? Might be fun to find out. You truly do have a bit of an evil streak. Your mother told me you did, but I never believed her. Jess wasn't sure why, but she admired him all the more. What was it about this man that she'd been in love with him for more than half her life? I do. I'm not even ashamed of it. I'm usually on the side of good. He flashed her a smile that had his dimples shown to their best advantage, she'd always loved his dimples. As long as you're on my side, I think we'll do just fine. He took her hand in his, his thumb stroking her palm. I have a feeling that from today forward, I won't even contemplate the opposite side. What if we're playing baseball and I'm on the other team? He frowned. Do you play baseball? Jess nodded. I grew up with two brothers. I was always the catcher. Are you any good? Better than most girls. It's the long legs, you see. You are inordinately tall. Does my height bother you? She asked. I'm six inches taller than you. Why would your height bother me? It will be nice to dance with you and not have to hurt my back as I hunch over. Theodore grinned at her. When will we dance? Is there a place to dance around here? Jess hadn't seen anything that could possibly work for dancing, but she loved to dance, and being held in his arms for the length of a song would make her happier than she could express. Yup. My place. Kendall plays the guitar and sings. He's actually really good. I would love to hear him play. Just don't start thinking that you can fall in love with a guitar player. You came out here to marry me if you'll remember. He couldn't believe he was feeling a bit of jealousy over her interest in Kendall's guitar playing. It was silly. I came out here to marry a Mountie, and you promptly told me you didn't want me. Remember? I think I've changed my mind. His words were soft, but she heard them. Did that mean he wanted to marry her? Or just court her? How much time do you have left in your lunch hour? Jess asked, realizing they'd been sitting there talking for a long time. He checked his watch and jumped to his feet. I was supposed to be back ten minutes ago. No one will know, but I'm never late for anything. I'll have to work ten minutes late to make up for it. He reached a hand down to help her to her feet. I'll see you at supper time. Will all the men be there? She called after him as he all but ran back to the office. It was a good thing she could see the cabin from where she was. He wasn't going to escort her home from the looks of it. All five of us Mounties, he hollered back as he disappeared around the corner. Jess shook her head as she picked up the remains of their picnic and folded the blanket. Their first outing had been one she'd never forget. He was interested in her and wanted to get to know her better. She would be walking on air for the rest of the day. Theodore Hughes had realized she was more than just a pest. She couldn't think of anything that would make her happier. She carried the picnic basket into the cabin along with the quilt, before going out the back door with a metal pail. She picked a bunch more berries. If he liked muffins that much, she'd make some to go with the omelets she had planned for breakfast the next day. She had an odd feeling that no one would mind at all. The men all seemed thrilled to have someone cooking for them. Miss Hazel looked up from her book as Jess came back into the cabin. Did you have a nice picnic? Oh, you don't have to answer that. I can see from your blush that you did. I'm glad. Jess smiled. I'm going to start supper and continue my cleaning. Do you want to help? Why would I help? You've got it handled. Miss Hazel waved her hand in the air, indicating Jess should do whatever she planned to do. Jess shook her head. It was a good thing she loved Miss Hazel, or she might get annoyed with her. Chapter 5 Dinner that night was a chaotic affair, and Jess found she loved it. Thirty minutes before it was time to eat, the five Mounties arrived carrying a table and four more chairs. Theodore put his hand on Jess's shoulder when they were finished setting everything up. We'll be back in a few minutes. 
Thank you for bringing the table and chairs, she said softly. Oh, that was Kendall's idea. He said there's no reason to have a pretty girl around if you can't see her while you eat, so he wanted to sit in a real chair. Don't get any ideas though. Jess blushed, shaking her head, don't worry. I'm not one to have my head turned by flattery. No, you don't seem the type. We'll all be back in a few minutes. Theodore was halfway to the door when he stopped. Maybe we can go for a walk after supper. I'd like that a lot. She loved the idea of walking in the moonlight with him. She knew there was a lake somewhere close by, and maybe they could walk along its shores. Did you decide to go dancing tonight? He frowned for a moment. If we dance tonight, everyone is going to expect to turn with you. For tonight, I want you all to myself. All right then. Jess watched as he left, having a hard time believing that this was the same man who had met her and his mother at the train station the day before. He had done a complete turnaround. Her heart could not be happier. As soon as he was gone, Miss Hazel walked up to her. So you and Teddy are going for a walk? Do you think I should go with you? Do you need a chaperone? Jess laughed, shaking her head. I thought you wanted the two of us to get together. And now you're teasing me about him? Which way do you want it? Miss Hazel hugged her tightly. You know there's nothing that I want more than you and Teddy to be happy together. I know you're the right bride for him. And I think eventually he's going to see that as well. I just hope we're still here for that one. I hope so too. But if not, I'll have given it my best shot. I'll have taken a chance on love, and I don't think I could ever regret that. Jess quickly mashed the potatoes and put the carrots into a bowl. She noted the men had carefully pushed the two tables together, so she set the second table, then put the roast beef and potatoes on each end of the long table formed. They could pass the carrots. She cut two loaves of bread up into thick slices, before setting out butter from the icebox. She surveyed the table for a moment, realizing something was missing. I'll be right back. Hurrying outside, she went to a bush, covered with perfect purple flowers. She carefully removed several, hurrying into the house and putting them into a water glass. She put the glass in the center of the two tables. There. That's perfect. Miss Hazel looked up from her book. Yes. That looks beautiful, Jess. Jess removed the apron she'd been wearing all day, hanging it on a hook by the door. She smoothed down the front of her dress, her hands going to straighten her hair. Why, she didn't know. Theodore had just been in there looking at her. He would know she primped for him. Was that a bad thing? The Mounties came in then, each of them in their spotless uniforms. Kendall, the youngest of the five, seemed almost shy in her presence. It gave her a bit more confidence. I sure hope everyone is hungry. Nolan rubbed his stomach. You know I am, ma'am. It feels like I haven't eaten in months. I know for a fact that you ate sixteen pancakes for breakfast. And several pieces of bacon. And I believe I saw you steal some bacon from Joel's plate. So you can say you feel like you haven't eaten in months, but we all know better. Nolan shrugged. What can I say? I'm a growing boy. Joel shook his head. I wondered why I had so little bacon at breakfast. You need to keep your hands off my plate. It was only one piece. Theodore shook his head at both of them. Thank you for cooking for us, Jess. Jess smiled. I love to cook. It's nice to have someone enjoy my food for a change. For a change? Elijah asked. Are there people back home who do not like your food? It's not that. I just don't get much chance to cook. I work full time. Or I did. My mother still does all the cooking in our home. She doesn't like other people in her kitchen. She taught me to cook, because she knew I needed to know how, but she hasn't let me back into it very often. Jess shrugged, waving everyone toward the table. Let's eat. I made fresh bread. And dessert is on the work table. Nolan perked up at the word dessert. You made dessert? If Theodore decides not to marry you, I'm keeping you. Jess blushed. 
Someday someone will love me for more than my cooking. Theodore took a seat at the table, looking up at Jess. Don't act like that day is so far away. You never know. Already he felt himself drawn to her more than he imagined was possible. The little girl in braids had changed into a beautiful young woman. Jess sat at one end of the table, and she noticed that Miss Hazel sat at the other. Joel and Elijah sat on either side of her. Elijah had that one curl hanging down over his forehead again. She watched as he swiped it away, but it fell right back to where it was. Theodore bowed his head and said the blessing for the table. When he was finished, the men all immediately reached for food. I can't remember the last time I had a decent pot roast. I think it was the last time I was back in Regina. Nolan reached for the platter with the meat on it and piled food on his plate. I hope you enjoy it. Jess knew she could cook for these men every day, because it was so obvious they enjoyed every single bite. Her brothers had liked her cooking, but they'd been used to good meals growing up with their mother, so it hadn't been such a big deal to them. Teddy tells me that you play the guitar, Jess said to Kendall. I'd love to hear you play sometime while I'm here. Kendall seemed embarrassed. I'd be happy to play sometime. Do you play? Jess shook her head. I had some piano lessons when I was younger, but I haven't played in years. Theodore smiled at Jess. We'll make sure we have at least one night in with Kendall playing for us before you go. If you go. Jess was surprised, he hadn't really talked about the possibility of her staying. Was it possible that she wouldn't be going back to Ottawa embarrassed? I'd like that a lot. What I'd like a lot is to plan a wedding before I leave. Miss Hazel took a bite of her potatoes. She was obviously not at all shy about saying what she felt. Jess wished she could be just a bit more circumspect. She looked down at her plate in embarrassment. Mom, please don't embarrass Jess. I want her to want to stay here. She's going to run far, far from our family, if you keep that up. Theodore knew it wasn't true, but maybe if his mother believed it was, she'd stop. Miss Hazel shook her head at her son. You underestimate Jess. She was raised with two older brothers. She's seen more than her share of teasing over the years. I promise you she can handle anything I have to say. Theodore shrugged at Jess. I tried. And I do appreciate it. I know Miss Hazel well. We just have to take everything she says with a grain of salt. At least I know she loves me. Jess took a sip of her water, watching Theodore over the rim of it. She still couldn't believe he was interested in her as a woman. After supper was done, Jess went to the basin to start washing the dishes. Miss Hazel walked up behind her. You've been working all day. Go on your walk. I'll wash up. Jess looked between Theodore and his mother for a moment, wondering if she should take Miss Hazel up on her offer. I don't know. I should help. Miss Hazel put her hands on her hips. Teddy, tell Jess that since she worked all day with no help from me, it's perfectly acceptable for her to let me do the dishes, so she can walk with you. Theodore looked at his mother with surprise. You really didn't help her at all today? Not even a little? Not one bit. I figured she needed to learn what it would be like being a wife out here in the wilderness, before she made any final decisions. So she's seeing what it's like. Miss Hazel poured hot water into the basin and added the dishes. I've got this. Have fun. Theodore didn't need to be told again. He grabbed Jess's hand and pulled her outside the cabin. There's a lake about a five-minute walk from here. Would you like to go there? Jess nodded, surprised that he was thinking the same way she was. She thought walking by the water would be very romantic. They strolled along slowly, not saying anything until they'd reached the water. There's a bench where we can sit and watch the water, or we can really walk for a while. It's up to you. Jess shrugged. I don't mind either way. With all the work you did today, are you too tired to walk? He asked. Not at all. I'm used to hard work. Then I'd like to walk if you don't mind. I was sitting all day, and I'm used to hard work too. As they walked along the shoreline, he looked down at her. What do you think of my little town? She smiled. 
I've always dreamed of living in a place just like this. It seems almost idyllic. It is for the most part. It's a quiet little town where little happens. I think it would be hard to be a woman living here with no other women for friends though. That was his biggest concern about her staying. He would hate for her to marry and stay with him and hate it there, it might be. I had two friends who I did absolutely everything with back in Ottawa. One of them threw a shoe at me when she found out I was moving out here. She'll be happy to see me, I'm sure. His eyes widened at that. One of your closest friends threw a shoe at you. Is that how she shows her friendship? Jess laughed. Lisa was upset with me for agreeing to move away, and it was her way of expressing herself. She deliberately missed if that helps. Only a little. He sighed, wondering why women were such odd creatures. Do you think you could live out here without other women around? I do think I could. I'm sure your friends will marry eventually though, so I wouldn't be the only woman out here forever. That's true. He led her to a log from a tree that had been knocked over by lightning. He sat down and invited her to sit beside him by patting the log. I know things didn't start out well between us when you arrived, but I'm glad you're here now. Very glad. Me too. She was startled when he moved a bit closer to her on the log. He cupped her cheek with one hand. I know I probably shouldn't kiss you yet, because we only decided today to try courting, but our time together is so limited. Everything has to go at a very fast pace. May I kiss you, Jessica? Jess nodded nervously. She'd never let a man kiss her before, though a few had tried. She'd never seen the point when there was no way they could ever have a serious relationship, because her heart belonged to Theodore. I guess so. He looked down into her eyes before slowly lowering his head and brushing his lips against hers. Jess felt her heart jump into her throat. Her whole body felt alive. She put her arms around his neck, moving closer to him. She never wanted him to stop kissing her. When he lifted his head, he smiled at her, one thumb tracing her bottom lip. I think we can put kissing on the list of things we enjoy doing together. She giggled. Are we making a list? I think we should. We have to evaluate everything logically, don't we? I mean, you have to decide if you can put up with me. She shook her head. I don't think you can be terribly logical about matters of the heart. If my heart wants to stay, then I'll stay. If you want me to, that is. Please ask me to stay. Please ask me to stay. So if your heart told you to marry an outlaw who murdered people, you'd marry him? Well, first of all, where would a sheltered young lady like me meet an outlaw to fall in love with? And secondly, I don't see my heart wanting a man like that. She shook her head. It's not who I am. No, I know it's not. Mom said you helped out a lot for all of her fundraisers and quilting parties. You were always one of the ladies who worked the hardest. He ran his hands over her arms when he noticed she was chilly in the cool night air. She mentioned you in every letter she sent me, telling me all the wonderful things you've done for the community. I was starting to think you were some sort of saint. Jess laughed. I'm not a saint at all. Trust me, I have lots of faults. Oh? Theodore raised an eyebrow as he studied her. Like what? She shook her head adamantly. I'm not telling you that. You're going to have to find the faults for yourself. Is that a challenge? She laughed softly. How can it be a challenge when they're right out there in the open for the whole world to see? I've known you for your entire life, and I've never noticed one. Oh really? Her look was skeptical. Well, you did have an annoying habit of following me around at recess. And you broke your slate over Tommy's head when he made fun of you for not understanding a math problem once. She grinned. I remember that day. The teacher used her ruler on my palm and sent home a note to my mother, who was not happy with me. I wasn't allowed to leave the house except for church and school for two weeks. Tommy deserved it, though. He was always picking on you. He picked on all the girls, but I was the only one who broke a slate over his head. Her temper was one of her biggest faults, and she knew it. Theodore grinned. That's true. I was secretly cheering for you from the back row. 
Really? I thought all the boys were on Tommy's side. Not me. I thought you had a lot of spunk even then. He stood up, taking her hand. We should get back to the cabin before Mom sends out a search party. She'll think I ran off with you. I don't think she will. Jess shrugged. She knows both of us better than that. Yes, she does. But that won't stop her from worrying. He walked back slowly, not wanting his time with her to end. We're all coming over for breakfast again. I've decided to leave the extra table and chairs until Mom is ready to leave. Her heart skipped a beat when he mentioned his mom leaving and not her. Was it possible he was seriously contemplating keeping her and not just joking about it? It was what she wanted more than anything. I think that's wise. I have a feeling your cabin is going to be the gathering spot for meals as long as we're here. Is that good or bad? Jess shrugged. It's nice to be appreciated. I don't mind them all being around. I'd be cooking anyway. It's just a little more work to cook for more people. What do you have planned for breakfast? He asked. Don't you think you should be surprised with the rest of the Mounties? She knew he'd be pleased with anything she cooked, so she didn't feel the need to tell him. It was fun having her cooking so very appreciated. Probably. Do you mind that I'm a Mountie? She frowned. Why would I mind that you're a Mountie? You're serving your country. It's a dangerous job. A lot of women aren't willing to tie themselves to a man who goes out, never knowing if he'll return. I'm made of stronger stuff than most women. I can handle it. It might be hard for me at times, but I'd manage. They stopped walking as they reached his cabin. He cupped her face in both hands, kissing her once more. You're a very special young lady, Jessica. She sighed, resting her forehead against his shoulder. I hope you always think so. She kissed him quickly, before heading into the cabin. Good night, Teddy. I'll see you for breakfast. As the door closed in his face, Theodore stared at it for a moment. And I'll see you in my dreams. Chapter 6 Miss Hazel slept in again the following morning. Well, she at least stayed in the bedroom while Jess made breakfast for the Mounties again. They arrived right on time, and Jess blushed when she saw Theodore. Was he thinking about their kisses like she was? When everyone was sitting, she gave them each an omelette and put a basket of muffins in the middle of the table. I have another pan of muffins in the oven, so don't worry about taking extra, she said. I have another omelette for you as well, Nolan. I know you'll never make it to lunch with only one. Nolan nodded his thanks, his mouth already full. Once he'd finished chewing, he said to Theodore, You're the dumbest man alive if you let this one go. Theodore didn't comment, just concentrated on his breakfast. He watched the way the other Mounties interacted with Jess, and he wasn't sure if he liked it or not. On the one hand, he liked that she was friendly with his co-workers, but on the other, every time she smiled at one of them, he wanted to announce that she was his. Jess talked to each of the Mounties as if they were important to her, making it clear she remembered little details she knew about them. When Nolan finished his first omelette, she jumped up to get him another. She talked to Kendall about his singing, and asked Joel if he was enjoying his time out in the field instead of having to work in the office. She didn't have a lot to say to Elijah, but she had an amused look on her face every time she looked at him. Finally, she said, I have my scissors with me. Would you like me to cut your hair, Elijah? Elijah shook his head, his curl flopped onto his forehead, and he pushed it away quickly. It doesn't matter if my hair is cut short or not. It always does this. Well, the offer's open if you want me to do it while I'm here. Theodore knew his emotions were ridiculous, but that didn't change them at all. He wanted her to get along with his co-workers, but he didn't want her to get along that well. He took her hand in his, knowing they'd take that as a sign she was taken. Are you going to have lunch with me again today? Jess was startled by his clear announcement that they were courting, but she nodded, if you'd like. I need to do laundry and mending today, but I'd be happy to throw together some lunch in the midst of all that. If you don't mind, that would be wonderful. I'd definitely rather spend time with you at lunch than eat at my desk. Jess smiled. All right. 
Do you want me to bring lunch to you, or do you want to come here? I'll come to you. He nodded toward the closed bedroom door. Mom can join us if she wants. Oh, I'm sure she'll take her lunch outside or hide in there and read while you're here. She's determined we spend as much time alone together as possible, Theodore smiled. For once, my mother and I are in complete agreement. He brought her hand to his lips and kissed it. The other men slowly excused themselves, seeming a little embarrassed by the conversation. After they'd left, Jess frowned at him. What was that about? I was beginning to wonder if you were going to make a sign saying that I was yours and hang it around my neck. He frowned at her. Well, we're courting. You shouldn't be flirting with them. Flirting? Jess stood up, angry with him. What was I doing that was flirting? She began clearing the table, stacking dishes loudly. How on earth could he have taken her innocent conversation as flirtation? You made sure that Nolan knew you made him extra breakfast. And you offered to cut Elijah's hair. She dumped the dishes into the basin and crossed her arms over her chest. Nolan is always hungry, and Elijah needs a haircut. Maybe so, but you don't need to be the one to do it. I'm not sure that I want to have lunch with you today, Theodore. She turned her back on him as she poured hot water from the kettle into the sink. I won't put up with you being jealous when I'm just being kind. Theodore closed his eyes for a moment. He knew she was right, but he didn't care at that moment. So because I got upset, I don't get to eat lunch? Really? She stood there, washing the dishes, wondering why he was still there. What was wrong with him? Finally, she said, aren't you going to be late for work? He walked up behind her and put his hands on her shoulders, turning her around. I guess I was being ridiculous, wasn't I? She nodded. Your mother made it clear that our job while we were here was to make life better for all of you, not just you. So I've been endeavoring to do that. I'm sorry. He pulled her into his arms, holding her close. Will you forgive me? Jess tilted her head to one side. I suppose I can do that. He smiled, leaning down to brush his lips against hers. Well, then maybe I can come for lunch? If you don't mind? Yeah, I'll cook something. But be nicer about your friends being around. They don't get good home-cooked meals very often either. I know, I shouldn't have been so rude. Theodore rushed toward the door. I'll see you at noon. Jess stared at the door after he'd closed it. First, he didn't want her, and now he wanted her and got jealous with everyone who looked at her. She worried about his mental health. Turning back to the basin, she finished washing the dishes, then started boiling the water again for laundry. It was going to be a busy day, but she would leave her mark on his cabin after she left. Every time he slipped into his bed with the clean sheets, he'd think of her. Every time he wore a sock that didn't have a hole in it, he'd think of her. She hurried to start her day. He'd be home for lunch in four and a half hours. When Theodore left the office for his lunch hour, he was reluctant to see Jess. He felt like he'd made a fool of himself with the way he'd acted at breakfast time. She'd said she'd forgiven him, but she shouldn't have to put up with jealousy from him. She'd given him no reason to think that she was interested in any of his co-workers. When he got to the house, she was out back, checking the laundry on the line. He stepped inside and shook his head in amazement. All of the curtains were off the windows and hanging on the line. You worked hard this morning. She shrugged, hurrying into the house. I always work hard. I can't bear to sit around idly. She hurried to the stove, dished up a big bowl of soup for him, and cut him a piece of fresh bread. They'd eaten every bit of the loaves she'd made the previous night, so she'd made twice as much for today. Maybe the men could take some for their lunches the following day. She got her own lunch and joined him at the table, smiling when he took her hand for their prayer. Thank you for getting so much done, he said softly. I had no idea this place could look so good. It was dirty when I moved in, and I've done little to help it over the years. Oh, that's not true. I could tell you'd swept it out nicely before we came. And you've scrubbed the floor since. I appreciate everything you're doing for me. She hoped she was doing it for both of them, but she didn't say that. 
She didn't want him to know how strongly she was hanging her hopes on him asking her to stay as his wife. Tomorrow Sunday. Are there church services? He nodded. It's our weekend for a preacher. There aren't enough ministers in the area, but we have one that comes in every fourth week. We Mounties take turns the other weeks. Well, not Kendall yet. He's too shy to speak in front of others. He does seem shy. He plays guitar well, though. I have a hard time reconciling the shy young man I've met with someone who plays guitar in front of others. It's odd, but he seems to forget he's in front of other people when he's playing. He nodded toward the bedroom. Is mom in there? No. She went looking for more blackberries. She thought it would be nice if we could make enough jam for all five of you men before we go. And more muffins, of course. When I offered everyone muffins for their lunch, I was shocked at how quickly they disappeared. Theodore laughed. I wasn't. It was exactly what I expected to happen. I almost shouted that they needed to leave the muffins for me, but I knew that wouldn't go over well. How long does the preacher stay when he's here? She asked, wondering if he would even be around to marry them if they did decide to marry. She may have to go home to Ottawa at the end of her week there, just because she couldn't marry. She knew Mounties were able to take the place of clergymen often, but not in the case of marriage. He'll be here through Tuesday, then leave again. I see. So tell me what it's like to work for a bank? She shrugged. I enjoy the other women I work with. We talk when it's not busy. Mostly it's just a lot of work, but you still find time to do things with the ladies' group at the church. Mom talks about you being there all the time. I work, have friends, and I volunteer at the church. It keeps me busy. Jess had found that being busy was one of the most important things to her. She couldn't abide sitting around idly. It made her crazy. Why hasn't there been a man in your life? I know I asked that before, but I didn't feel like I got a real answer. Jess bit her lip for a moment. She thought about avoiding the question, but she decided to just be honest with him. If it scared him and he ran away, then he wasn't worthy of her anyway. Because even though men asked me out regularly, none of those men were you. I always felt like I should be waiting for true love in my life, and to me, that meant waiting for you. He swallowed the bite of food in his mouth and slowly wiped his lips with his napkin. Do you mean to say if it had been another man my mother asked you to travel to marry, you wouldn't have agreed? She nodded. I wouldn't have. I only agreed because you were the one at the other end of the train. I used to follow you around at recess because I had a terrible crush on you. I followed you home from school that day because I was daydreaming, and I just kept walking, my eyes on you. When I realized that you'd seen me, I was mortified. Does my mother know all of this? Jess shook her head adamantly. She didn't know I had feelings for you until you rejected me at the train station. She guessed then. I've never said a word to her. She shrugged. I've always liked Miss Hazel. She's felt like a friend to me. My relationship with her was always separate from my feelings for you. I would love to have a mother-in-law like her one day, but I would never become friends with someone so I would have a chance with her son. Theodore frowned. Well, I didn't think you'd become friends with her just to get closer to me. I, I'm not exactly sure how I feel about all this. I mean, I know I have feelings for you now, but I certainly didn't all those years ago. She nodded. You left town when I was still a girl. The fact that you stayed in my mind as the only man I could ever marry was something that you couldn't have known. I did want to scratch Judy's eyes out of her head. He laughed. Judy was the girl he'd squired around town just before he'd left to join the mounted police. You already mean more to me than she ever did, if that helps your feelings at all. Jess smiled. It doesn't really matter how you feel about her. She's married with two small children now. She seems happy. I didn't realize she'd married, but I haven't really thought of her in years, so I guess that doesn't matter to me a great deal. He stood. I have to get back to work. Jess nodded, standing up to clear the table. What would you like for supper tonight? You don't have to feed us every night you're here. 
He didn't want her to think that he was taking advantage of the way she felt about him to get meals for him and his friends. I know I don't. I enjoy cooking. He stepped toward her, gripping her shoulders. Just as he started to lower his head to kiss her, the door slammed open. How was lunch? Miss Hazel asked. He squeezed her shoulders in farewell and turned to his mom. It was delicious. Jess could give you cooking lessons, mom. I know. She's always been better than me. I pretended to teach her to cook though. She put the basket of berries onto the table and linked her arm with his. I'll walk you back to the station. I haven't had any time alone with you since I got here. Jess watched them go with a look of longing on her face. She so badly wanted to be part of their family, but would he ever be able to trust her again after she'd told him she'd had a secret crush on him for years and years? She looked down into the berry basket. She could make muffins a couple of more times with that amount of berries, but she wouldn't be able to make jam, she'd go out herself on Monday and see what she could find. Once the dishes were done, she brought the clothes in from the line and started the long process of mending. Jess was good at most domestic tasks, but she hated sewing. She could do it with the best of them, but she'd rather poke the needle into her eye than spend hours and hours sewing garments. Better to get it over with. When Miss Hazel returned thirty minutes later, she sat down across from Jess and picked up the next garment that needed mending. I love sewing, don't you? Jess didn't answer. She just kept sewing on buttons. It wasn't until church on Sunday that Jess realized just how isolated she would be if she stayed in Squirrel Ridge Station. There was one older woman in the congregation, and everyone else was male, besides her and Miss Hazel. She'd really thought that Theodore must have been exaggerating about the lack of women in the area, but he wasn't. After the service, there was an entire line of men waiting to meet her, and Jess wanted to disappear into the floor. It wasn't that she was shy, she just wasn't interested in meeting a new man. Theodore was the only man she'd ever want, finally, he had introduced her to the last man. There really are no women here, she said to him. He nodded. Could you handle it? She shrugged. I'm not sure. I think I could, but I've never been in that situation, so I can make no promises. She knew if she had just one female friend to be close to it would be easier for her, but she would just pray for the other Mounties to find wives. You're wise to hesitate. It's hard for us, and we have each other. He offered her his arm, and they walked together out of the church. Everyone is planning to get their own lunch, so you're off the hook for that, but we'd all appreciate it if you'd make supper again tonight. I was planning to do that. Any idea what you want? How about a thick, hearty beef stew? With big chunks of potatoes and carrots. And fresh bread. Theodore broke off. I'm practically drooling thinking about it. If I don't stop, you'll think I'm Nolan. Jess laughed. I think I know the difference between you and Nolan now. I hope so. He smiled at her, wondering how it was going to feel to be alone again. When she got back on that train for Ottawa, she'd be taking his heart with her, but he didn't know how she'd do in their little hamlet with no other women. It wouldn't be right for him to ask her to stay. Am I fixing you lunch today? she asked. Would you mind? I'd really rather not have to eat my own cooking any more than absolutely necessary. She shook her head. I'd be happy to. How would you feel about breakfast foods? They're quick and I can have something on the table in a few minutes. He shrugged. I'm sure if you make it, then it will be absolutely delicious. You have more confidence in me than I do. She led the way into the house, immediately stoking the fire so she could cook. You know, it's easier to cook over coal. He laughed. I'm afraid a coal stove is a bit too pricey for Amanda's budget. I make do with what I have. Jess was surprised by his words, because she knew his family had money. Surely he could just ask for what he needed, but he was a man. She knew there was probably pride involved. I understand. I learned to cook over a wood stove, but my mother upgraded when I started working at the bank, and there was more money in our household. He sat at the table, watching as she pulled on an apron over her Sunday dress, and got to work. He could watch her cook all day. 
Chapter 7 Jess spent all day Sunday with Theodore. They went on a long walk, he watched her cook, and they just talked and got to know one another better. It was a day that was filled with joy for her, because she was spending time with the man she loved. Monday morning dawned, and Jess couldn't believe how sad she was. She knew her only chance to spend a full day with Theodore was over. He had said nothing else about her staying, so she had a feeling he was going to put her on the train on Thursday, a feeling that made her heart hurt. She cooked a large breakfast of French toast, eggs, and bacon for the Mounties. Nolan's eyes lit up when he walked into the cabin. He was obviously very excited about the big breakfast. Are you sure you won't stay? I'd do just about anything to keep you. Theodore shook his head. Stay away from my girl. You only want her for cooking anyway. Elijah looked at Theodore. Are you sure about that? She's awful pretty. Maybe he thinks he can steal her from you. Jess looked at Elijah with surprise. That was the most she'd ever heard him say, and his eyes were filled with mischief. Don't poke the bear, she told Elijah. Theodore put his hands on his hips, towering over Jess. So now I'm a bear? Jess patted Theodore's chest right in the middle of his scarlet mounty jacket. Yes, dear, but you only growl occasionally. Elijah laughed. She's got your number. He walked over to sit down at the table, winking at Jess, who giggled. Theodore just shook his head. I'm not going to let you bother me. Jess will only be here for a few more days, and I'm making the most of it. I'll growl after she's gone. Jess smiled sweetly at Elijah. I'll make sure you have my address so that you can let me know if he really did. You're not going to be giving your address to my friends. Why would you even say that? Theodore asked. You're the one threatening to act like a bear. Just for that, I may not let you fix me lunch today. Jess laughed. Is fixing your lunch a privilege? I really worry about you sometimes, Teddy. My mother always said that feeding me was a privilege. Are you saying that you don't think it is? You don't have a burning desire deep inside your soul to feed me three meals a day? His eyes were wide, as if he couldn't believe she didn't want to feed him constantly. Oh, I do have that desire. Please, will you let me feed you lunch today? I'm so sorry that I was rude and said I would give my address to your friend. Theodore frowned for a moment, but then nodded. I will allow you to feed me. I forgive you for your transgressions. Jess shook her head at him, noticing that all the Mounties were watching them as they ate their breakfasts. You should probably sit before Nolan eats your share of the food. I'm a growing boy. I haven't stolen any food since Friday morning. Nolan protested. Theodore sat at the table, carefully moving his plate away from Nolan. How many strips of bacon did you give everyone? Jess smiled. Only six. I only have three. Theodore turned to Nolan, noticing all the bacon was gone from his plate. How can you be an officer of the law if you're constantly stealing from others? Jess laughed. I gave everyone three. I just wanted to see what you'd say. Elijah smiled at Jess. I really like you. Have I told you that yet? I think you should stay. I don't know about staying. Jess was sad just thinking about it. Theodore would have asked her to stay by now if he wanted her to, right? After breakfast, Theodore walked up behind Jess as the other men left for the day. You're not really going to give the men your address, are you? She shook her head. Of course not. I've told you before. There's only one man I'll ever love. There's no point in making another man think there's a possibility of something more. Good, I think it would break my heart if you started a correspondence with one of them. He kissed her cheek and walked out the door to start his day. Jess watched him go with tears in her eyes. He wasn't going to ask her to stay. He'd all but told her he wasn't. Miss Hazel came out into the kitchen and sat at the table watching Jess for a moment before saying anything. Don't lose hope. Jess dashed away a tear that was drifting down her cheek. I'm trying not to, but he's not going to ask me to stay, Miss Hazel. I know it. I'm not so sure. He has feelings for you, Jess, 
there's no doubt in my mind. I'm curious as to why he isn't being more forthcoming about asking you to stay, but he will be. I know it. Miss Hazel walked over to hug Jess, before taking her plate from the work table. It is really nice to be able to sleep late and have my breakfast waiting for me when I get up. I'm starting to get used to being pampered by you. I'm happy to oblige. She finished up the dishes, leaving the water in the sink so Miss Hazel could wash her own. I'm going to go berry picking. I'll be back in time to make Theodore his lunch. She took two of the pails that were beside the door. They were metal and similar to the pails a school child would take their lunch in. She wandered away from town, not really knowing where she was going, but knowing she needed some time alone to think. And what better way to think than to walk through nature? She walked around the lake and found a large berry patch. She quickly picked as many as would fit in the buckets, and then a few more for her mouth, because they were perfectly ripe and delicious. She found both blackberries and raspberries, which pleased her. She'd come back after lunch for another bucket of each. The men would be thrilled with the jams she made from them, and of course she'd make more muffins for Theodore before she left. As she walked, she thought about going home. Would she move back in with her parents? Or would she and Miss Hazel set out to travel the world again? If Theodore didn't want her to stay, she would be free to do as she pleased. She promised herself she'd bring it up to Miss Hazel as soon as she returned to the cabin, but when she arrived, Miss Hazel was nowhere to be found. There was no telling what the older woman had gotten up to, so she washed the berries and made sure all the stems were removed. Then she made a simple lunch of leftover stew from the night before. She marveled that there was anything left after Nolan had eaten his share, but she deliberately made twice as much as she thought the group would eat. Enough for lunch today had been her plan. She made some biscuits to go with the stew and promised herself she'd make more bread that afternoon. The Mounties all liked to have fresh bread every evening with their supper, and if she could do something so simple that would bring them such pleasure, why wouldn't she? They were serving their country after all, their lives on the line on a regular basis. Of course she'd make their lives better during her short time there. When Theodore came in for lunch, she was just setting food on the table. Do you know where your mother is? she asked. I haven't seen her since breakfast. He shook his head, eyeing the berries she'd picked. Is all that for jam or am I getting more muffins? Jess laughed. You'll get muffins and jam. I found a big patch of berries, so I'm going to go and pick a bunch more. I'm surprised no one else is picking them. Where's the patch? On the other side of the lake. Yeah, the men aren't likely to wander over that way to pick them. Feel free to pick as many as you'd like. It's public land there. I'd hurry though, or the birds might beat you to them. He sat down at the table, reaching for a biscuit and buttering it. Besides, I'll take all the muffins and jam you want to make for me. Jess sat down with him, her hand going to his for their prayer. I'll do my very best to get as much stored up for you as I can before I go. I'm going to wander over to the mercantile later, to get some canning supplies. Now don't go spending all your time shopping and picking berries, he said with a grin. We need to eat tonight, too. I have never seen men eat as much as the five of you do. I don't know how you all stay so slim. We work hard, and we only eat like this when there's good food to eat. Well, except Nolan. I swear I saw him eat a bug once. That man is never full. I'll make a few meals on Wednesday that you can all heat up over the next few nights and put them into the icebox. I want you to have meals for as long as I can provide them. She looked down at her stew. If he wanted her to stay, surely he'd say something now. Please, please, please say something now, Teddy. I need you to ask me to stay. We'd all really appreciate that, Jessica. Having you here has been like a dream. A dream I never want to wake up from. You brought joy to all of us, not only with your cooking, but with your ready smile and your sharp tongue. I don't know why you have a sharp tongue, but you sure do. Theodore wished she'd tell him she could stay. He couldn't ask her to live a life without female companionship, but he wanted her there, at his side, for the rest of his life. I've enjoyed being here. I felt really needed. 
It's hard to feel needed when all you do is count out money for bank customers. She finished her stew and put her bowl into the basin. Theodore watched her, wondering just how lonely he was going to feel after she was gone. For days, she'd filled his every waking thought, and the very idea of her leaving physically hurt. Staying with Joel for another month was preferable to letting her get on that train on Thursday. He had to think of some way to get her to stay, even if it meant getting his mother to feign an illness. He needed more time with her than a week's visit afforded him. After Theodore was gone, she hurried back to the berry patch. Jess figured she could make three more trips there before she needed to start supper. If she could figure out where Miss Hazel went, she was sure she would help her, but she was missing for whatever reason. When she returned to the house, Miss Hazel was at the table, reading again. Where'd you go? Miss Hazel shrugged. I needed to walk and think about what happens next. I was wondering that myself. I guess I'm going back to my parents' house. I wonder if I can get my job at the bank back. You can't work at that old bank again. You hated it there. Miss Hazel shook her head adamantly. Jess nodded, carefully picking the stems and leaves out of the buckets of berries. I did, but I need to be doing something. There aren't a lot of jobs for ladies. No there aren't, but I don't want you going back to that awful bank. Maybe you could live with me. As my companion. You don't need someone living with you, Miss Hazel, Jess said. You are perfectly capable of living on your own. I know I am, but I get lonely. I get stir-crazy. And then I come up with ridiculous ideas that involve marrying my son off to someone he hasn't agreed to marry, and I make a mess of things. We should have just kept traveling. Would you like to finish our trip around the world? Jess shrugged. Somehow it's lost its appeal, I'm afraid. You want to stay here and cook for those five men, don't you? Of course I do. I want to marry Teddy and spend the rest of my life having babies and being in love. Miss Hazel frowned. Have you told him that yet? Jess shook her head. No, but I did tell him that the reason I'm still unmarried is because I've been in love with him since I was ten years old. I would think that would be the information he would need to have to know I want to stay with him forever. Maybe you need to just stay it right out, men are dense sometimes. Especially when it comes to matters of the heart. You need to talk to him and make sure he wants you to go. It would be a horrible thing if he wanted you to stay, and you wanted to stay, and you left anyway. Why, it would be a crime against love. Jess couldn't help but smile at that. You are so dramatic sometimes, Miss Hazel. She picked up her pails. I'm going to pick more berries. I'd love some help if you don't have some reading that has to be done. Miss Hazel got to her feet. I always have reading that has to be done, but I'm happy to help you pick berries. When are we making the jam? Tomorrow? We'll need to. I'm going to spend Wednesday making meals to last them a few nights. I worry that poor Nolan will starve to death. I've never in my days seen a man who can eat the way that man does. I worry that something's wrong with him. Jess grinned, handing Miss Hazel the two pails she carried, and fetching two more for herself. I think he's fine. He just likes food. They chatted about the five Mounties as they walked. I haven't quite figured Joel out yet. He's so serious, Jess said. Elijah is the one I don't understand. Have you heard the boy say more than three or four words at a time? I have. He was teasing Theodore about me this morning. I really enjoyed the whole conversation. Huh, Miss Hazel said. Maybe he's one of those men who needs to get to know you before he'll talk to you, but when he starts speaking, he never shuts up. Jess shrugged. That sounds like it could be right. Kendall is still pretty quiet but it sounds like he's very musically inclined. They reached the berry patch, and Jess put one of the buckets down while she started filling the other. Theodore has promised me there would be dancing one night before I go. There are only three nights left. Theodore is afraid to dance. He knows that the other men will each expect to turn with you. No one is going to want to dance with me. Jess smiled. I think if they realized just how sprightly you are, they'd beg to dance with you. I'm not much of a dancer myself, but I sure do enjoy watching. 
Miss Hazel smiled. You wouldn't have a chance to do any watching. The men would all want to turn to spin you around the floor. It's odd there are no other women here. It's a beautiful place, though, and I love it here. Jess put her full bucket on the ground and picked up the empty one, continuing to pick while she talked. I do wonder if I'd be able to keep from going mad if there were no other women around. It would be lonely. You miss your friends, don't you? Jess nodded. If Joanne or Lisa were here, this place would be my very own version of paradise. A man to love, friends to spend time with, and a beautiful place to walk and explore. Plenty of work to do. Only you would be looking for work to fill your paradise, Jess. Miss Hazel frowned. I wish I had an answer for you. Me too. But the only one who can change things at all is Teddy. And he has to want to. Jess continued picking berries, trying to keep her mind off the fact that she was leaving soon. Tomorrow the preacher would be gone, and there'd be no way they could marry. Chapter 8 When the Mounties filed in that night, Jess noted that Kendall was carrying his guitar. She smiled, happy that she'd have a chance to dance with Theodore. There was something about being held in a man's arms as he spun her around a room that made her feel loved. As soon as supper was over, Jess hurried to the sink, and she and Miss Hazel made short work of the dishes. As they were doing that, the men were pushing the tables up against the wall so there would be room for dancing. Kendall sat down in a chair along one wall and tuned his guitar. Jess was surprised when he started to play. Theodore had said he was good, but she'd had no idea he could possibly be that good. Why wasn't the man playing professionally? And when he sang, Jess felt goosebumps on her arms. He was absolutely fantastic. Theodore waited until Jess put down her dish towel, before grabbing her hand and spinning her out onto the floor. To Jess's amusement, Elijah bowed low in front of Miss Hazel, begging for the pleasure of her company on the dance floor. The beat was fast and fun, and Kendall seemed to pick up the pace after a bit. For the second dance, they switched partners and Jess danced with Nolan while Miss Hazel danced with Joel. When Kendall started a slower song, Jess found herself back in Theodore's arms. He's really good, she said, her voice filled with amazement. He is. He could be playing and singing professionally, but he was more interested in fighting bad guys, so he's here. We're glad to have him, because he's a good Mountie, and he does a lot to keep us entertained. I'm glad you have him. I can't imagine how lonely it would be if you didn't have someone like him around. Theodore nodded. I'll be lonelier than ever before when you get on that train to go back to Ottawa. Mother never should have put the idea of marrying in my head. I'm really sorry we showed up the way we did. I feel bad for my part in it. Jess didn't meet his eyes, and instead watched as Elijah and Miss Hazel danced cheek to cheek, Miss Hazel's eyes filled with mirth. I've never blamed you for what happened, Jess. At her look of disbelief, he amended his statement. Well, not after the first few minutes at the train station. When I had time to think about it, I knew you weren't being deceitful, that was all my mother. I don't think she'd ever do anything like that to anyone but me. She thought the two of you would get off the train and I'd marry you, because I would fulfill her promise. I couldn't, though. Jess sighed. I know. You haven't done anything wrong. I feel as though I have. He struggled to find the words he needed to say, the words that would make her want to stay. At the academy, they discourage Mounties from marrying. I always felt that if I did marry someday, it would feel like I was providing a hostage to any man who I angered in my line of work. And, is that how you feel? she asked. All I can think about is how much I want to have you by my side for the rest of my life. It's selfish of me because I know that your life back in Ottawa is so much better than I could give you here. A life with no friends to call your own. What kind of life would that be? If I was married to you, it would be wonderful. I can live without female friends, but I don't know that I can live without you. Her eyes met his for the first time since the conversation had started. When I dreamed of you and the future we could have together, it was just some sort of peaceful dream where we walked along hand in hand and smiled at each other a lot. She shook her head. Since I've taken the time to get to know you, to really spend time with you, to be kissed by you, 
I know I'll spend the rest of my life missing those things. Because now that I've had them, I want them forever. His heart sank at her words. She was rejecting him. Jess was still planning to go back to Ottawa and live out her life without him. Would it be better if I stayed away from you for the remainder of your time here? A tear sprang to Jess's eye. No, it wouldn't. Let me have my dream for a little bit longer. Please. He nodded, but he couldn't meet her eyes again. Not when she was crying. It was all he could do not to growl in pain, like the bear she'd called him. Maybe he should quit his job and go back to Ottawa. He could be a police officer there. It wouldn't be the same as being a Mountie, but he wasn't sure how much that mattered. Without Jess, his life wouldn't really feel complete. He stared over her head as he continued to spin her around the room. None of the other men tried to cut in. They must have recognized that he simply was incapable of letting her go for now. How could he? Soon she would be off to live her life without him, and he'd be left to deal with her memory. He would see her everywhere he walked. Jess wanted to beg him to let her stay, but if he didn't want her, then she wasn't going to plead. She'd find a way to be happy. She had to. Jess cried herself to sleep that night, and was glad there was no mirror the next morning. She didn't want to see her bloodshot eyes. She was up even earlier than usual, making muffins for the men to go with their eggs and bacon. She couldn't sleep, so she might as well work. While the muffins baked, she mixed the dough for bread, leaving it to rise on the work table. While she waited for the men to come, she got out a huge pot to make jam. She loved making jam, for some absurd reason no one understood, including herself. There were still berries left to be picked, so if she could get all of the jam made today, perhaps she'd have time to do more tomorrow. Then she wouldn't have to worry so much about Theodore or any of his friends having to eat the old bread that came from the mercantile. She forced herself to think only about the work she was doing, not letting her mind flit to going home. Home. It was such an odd word. It didn't even feel like Ottawa was still her home. She looked around the little cabin, thinking about how it had looked when she'd arrived. The windows now sparkled, and the floor was clean enough she wouldn't mind eating off of it. She pushed the jam to the back of the stove a few minutes before she knew the Mounties would arrive, and tried to tell herself she was happy. Knowing she wouldn't have to work nearly this hard back in Ottawa should thrill her, shouldn't it? Joel was the first of the Mounties to arrive that morning and he quickly set the room to rights, moving the table to the middle of the floor where it had been. Are you all right? he asked softly. Jess shrugged. I'm sure I'll be fine. She forced a smile to her face, but it took everything she had in her to do it. It actually hurt to try to turn up the corners of her mouth. She'd always been a relatively happy person, the first one to pitch in during a crisis. This wasn't going to change that about her. When Theodore walked into his cabin, his eyes immediately went to Jess. She looked so sad to him. He wanted to gather her in his arms and beg her to stay, but how could he do that? She'd already told him she had no intention of staying in British Columbia. Having grown up in the hustle and bustle of the nation's capital as she had, he knew that the quiet of Squirrel Ridge Station would never be right for her. No, they'd made the right decision, he was sure of it. Jess made sure she didn't make eye contact with Theodore as she served all of the men their breakfast. When she didn't immediately sit down to eat with them, Joel asked, Aren't you eating, Jess? Jess shook her head. I have to watch the jam. Go ahead without me, I'll get something later. She took a wooden spoon and continually stirred the jam, though it really wasn't necessary at all. After they'd eaten a particularly quiet meal, the men put their dishes into the basin so she could wash them. Theodore stopped behind her, but didn't touch her as he usually did. I'll need to work through my lunch break today. Maybe you or mom could run something over to the office? Of course. She knew she'd send his mother. He knew she'd send his mother. She was too heartbroken to do anything else. He left for work absolutely dejected. What did you say to the girl you loved, who was about to disappear from your life forever? He had to figure it out, because in two days, she'd be gone. As Jess washed the breakfast dishes, she saw the pastor ride out of town toward the north. He was gone, and so was her hope of marrying Theodore. There was no pastor now. 
their fate was sealed. When she'd finished with the jam, she made a sandwich for Theodore's lunch, left a note for Miss Hazel to deliver the lunch to him at noon, and she left the cabin, taking only paper and a pencil with her. She'd always enjoyed drawing, so she went to the lake and captured the sun over the water. She spent hours there, drawing whatever came to her, and at the end of the day, she felt better. She looked through the sketches she'd made, and after the one of the lake, every single sketch was of Theodore. She flipped through them, and couldn't help but smile. She'd captured him in every mood, but mostly she'd captured a look of love on his face. She closed the notepad, hugging it to her. Maybe she'd give it to his mother, but more likely she'd keep them to pull out and look at. She'd drawn him in his mounty uniform in every picture, knowing she'd always remember him that way. It was late afternoon when she finally got up and headed back toward the cabin. She needed to get supper on the table, and she didn't even know what she was going to cook. She didn't know if she had it in her to cook, but she couldn't let five men go hungry simply because she was sad. Whether she was heartbroken or not, Nolan would gnaw the back of his chair if he wasn't fed on time. When she stepped into the cabin, Miss Hazel was sliding something into the oven. Did you cook? Jess asked, I thought it would be best if I took my turn today. I made two large beef pot pies. Are you still planning to make several meals tomorrow to leave the Mounties with when we head back to Ottawa? Yes, I think I am. I don't really know what my plans are at the moment. My mind is spinning. When was the last time you ate something? Miss Hazel asked, looking at Jess with a worried expression. Lovesick or not, you have to eat to keep up your strength. Jess shrugged. I don't know. I think last night. Sit down. I'll fix something for you. Did you take Teddy his lunch? Jess asked, even in her confusion, thinking of Theodore first. Yes, I did. He said to thank you for making it for him. Miss Hazel broke a few eggs into a bowl and they added a dollop of milk. Do you want me to tell the men that you're not feeling well tonight? She poured her mixture into a frying pan. I don't know what I want. Is it possible to love someone so much that you ache inside? Miss Hazel sighed. I've come up with some stupid plans and schemes over the years, but this was the absolute worst. I truly believed that when Teddy saw you get off that train, he would marry you, simply because I'd said he would. I should have known my stubborn son better than that. She slid the plate of scrambled eggs in front of Jess, adding a couple of muffins from breakfast. I wouldn't have wanted him to marry me, just to keep your word to me. It wouldn't have been right. Maybe not, but I still thought it was what he'd do. Miss Hazel took the seat across from Jess, her face filled with sadness. I'm so sorry to have hurt you this way. I didn't realize you were already in love with him or I swear I'd never have attempted to get him to marry you this way. I know you wouldn't have. I'm not angry. Jess pushed the food around on her plate with the fork. It's always been Teddy for me. Every time a man asked me if he could court me, I told him no, because I couldn't imagine myself in love with anyone else. She took a bite of the food, but it tasted like sand. She didn't want to eat. She didn't want to do anything but sleep so she could forget the pain of being rejected by the man she loved. If you want to go to bed early tonight, I'll make your excuses. Jess was tempted, but she shook her head. No. I can't hide from my problems. As much as I'd like to avoid Teddy for the rest of my time here, I just can't do it. It's the coward's way out, and I'm anything but a coward. She stood up. I do think I'm going to lie down for an hour before supper, though, if that's not leaving too much of the work for you. Not at all. Miss Hazel stood up and walked around the table to hug Jess. I hope you don't hate me for my part in all of this. Jess smiled, though it hurt. I could never hate you, Miss Hazel. You're one of the most amazing women I know. She wandered off into the bedroom, not realizing until she was already there that she'd forgotten her notepad. No matter. She'd get it later. When she closed her eyes, all she could see was Theodore, but even in her dreams, he couldn't bring himself to ask her to stay. When Theodore arrived for supper that evening, he looked around for Jess. His mother stood at the stove, which surprised him. Where's Jessica? She's taking a little nap. 
She didn't sleep well last night. Theodore sank into one of the chairs at the table. Mom, I feel like the world's worst villain. I didn't mean to hurt her, but it seems that's all I've done since she arrived. That's not true. I've seen true joy shining from her eyes most of the time she's been here. You hurt her a lot the day she arrived at the train station. And whatever passed between you last night, well, it broke her heart. Is she okay? She will be. She dropped the notepad that Jess had spent the day drawing in on the table in front of him. She didn't do any work today other than making the jam. Instead, she went out by the lake and drew. She spent the whole day drawing, not even remembering to eat until a couple of hours ago when I fixed something and shoved it under her nose. I didn't know Jess could draw. He opened the notepad and smiled at the lake. She'd drawn it just the way it had been when they'd first walked beside it. This is beautiful. She does good work. She always has. She stood over the table watching him as he flipped to the next page and then the next. He saw his face staring back at him from every page. She'd captured him perfectly. He could remember each emotion he'd shown her as he thumbed through the notepad, but it was the emotion on the last page that made him want to drop to his knees and beg Jessica's forgiveness. He stood with a flower in his hand, one that he'd picked for her and tucked behind her ear as they'd walked. The look in his eyes was, well it was how he felt every time he saw her. His heart filled until it felt as if it was overflowing. There was nothing without her. He saw before him an endless stream of loneliness. Loneliness that no guitar music would ever take away. Does she know you're showing me this? He asked finally, looking up at his mother, who stood there watching him with tears in her eyes. She shook her head. No, Teddy. She doesn't even know that I've seen them. She left her notepad here when she went to take her nap. I don't think I was meant to see them at all. I know you weren't. He closed the notepad and laid it in the center of the table. I need some time. How long before supper's ready? About ten minutes. I'll be back. He left through the back door walking away from the house and toward one of the trees in the woods there, he had to do something to end their heartache. Chapter 9 When Miss Hazel came to get her for supper, Jess pushed her hair out of her face, putting it back into the bun she usually wore. It had fallen out during her nap, and she didn't want to look unkempt for a meal she had with Theodore and his friends. She would do her best to act happy, though she was certain they'd all be able to see that her heart was breaking by looking into her eyes. It was the first time in her life that she wished she wore spectacles. They would at least give her something to hide behind. She walked out to greet the Mounties, apologizing for her exhaustion. I don't usually sleep during the day, she said with a laugh. It sounded forced to her, but no one said anything. She walked to the work table to help Miss Hazel, but realized all the work was done. The Mounties were all seated at the table with their suppers in front of them. She sat in the same spot where she'd eaten all week, right next to Theodore. Thank you for cooking, Miss Hazel. Theodore tried not to look at Jess, but he planned to get her alone for a good long talk after supper. They would never work anything out if they didn't eat. While they ate, Elijah regaled them with an amusing tale of a homesteader a few miles south of town he'd run into that day. Apparently, the man didn't think that Canada allowed him to get enough sunshine so he'd taken to soaking up the sun's rays by working without a stitch of clothing on that day. Jess bit her lip to avoid laughing. He hasn't done this before? Surely someone who was that elemental would feel the need to work naked every day. Elijah shook his head. Not that I've seen, but he's new here. I don't think he's been in British Columbia for more than a month or two. He told me that any day it doesn't rain, he's going to work with no clothes on because he needs the extra sunshine in a world where the angels are always weeping on him. What did you say? Kendall asked. The young man obviously had never run into that type of situation before. I asked him to be mindful that ladies were in the area, by which I meant a few miles away, and they didn't need to be blinded by his startlingly white derriere. He promised to wear clothes for the rest of the day. Elijah shook his head, obviously enjoying the telling of the story. Theodore couldn't help but laugh, but what about tomorrow? He said tomorrow's problems would solve themselves. 
Elijah took another bite of his pot pie. When I left, he was headed inside to get some pants on. I told him no one's going to mind if he works with no shirt on. But he had to cover himself otherwise. Joel shook his head. You'd think common decency would tell the man that it's not right to work outdoors with no clothes on. Oh, he was wearing his socks and shoes. He didn't want to hurt his feet. Elijah shook his head. Oh, I can understand that, he could have stepped on a rock or something. Jess bit her lip, trying to control her mirth. Miss Hazel rolled her eyes. He's not going to be happy if he gets a sunburn where the sun isn't supposed to shine now, is he? Jess sipped her water, determined not to discuss or even think about the naked farmer again. You all must have a lot of fun adventures while you're working. What's the craziest thing you've encountered so far, Kendall? Jess didn't have to worry about talking again as all of the Mounties took turns talking about amusing things they'd seen and done in their positions. After supper, she helped Miss Hazel clear the table. You should go spend some time with your son, Jess said when the older woman moved to help her with the dishes. Tomorrow's our last day here, and I'm certain you'll miss him. She was just as certain she didn't want to spend time talking to him. If she was doing the dishes, she could easily avoid the man. Miss Hazel seemed torn for a moment, but then she nodded. I'll go talk to him. An hour later, Miss Hazel was back in the cabin, looking tired. Teddy went off to bed. I haven't seen him look that sad since his father died, Jess frowned. She was at the table sewing one last button on a shirt for Theodore and mentally planning out what she'd cook the next day. What meals do you think I should cook tomorrow, Miss Hazel? We want them to have good food for as long as possible. I don't think he wants you to go, Jess. Miss Hazel got right to the heart of the conversation she needed to have with Jess. She'd never been one to pussyfoot around a subject. Whether he wants me to or not, he's allowing me to go. He's practically pushing me out the door. Jess jabbed the cloth with her needle, much harder than necessary. Miss Hazel sat down at the table with Jess. I think you should tell him you want to stay. He thinks he's being noble by not asking you to give up your life and live out here with him. Jess shrugged. I've bared my soul to him. He knows how I feel, and he's letting me go. What else can I say to him? It wasn't that she didn't want to talk to him. She really did feel everything that could possibly sway him had already been said. Have you tried, Teddy? I love you, and I want to stay here. It doesn't matter there's no electricity, or other women. All I need is you. I think that would work. There's no point. It's not the lady's job to say those things anyway. It's the man's. Jess finished sewing on the button and got to her feet. Good night, Miss Hazel. She walked back to the room she was sharing with the older lady and changed into her nightgown, putting her thick brown hair into a braid that cascaded down her back. Before Miss Hazel was in the room, Jess had her eyes closed and was feigning sleep. Theodore was the first of the Mounties at breakfast the following morning. He felt uncomfortable being alone with Jess, because he was hurt that she didn't want to stay, and he could see she was angry with him about it, which made no sense at all. What did she have to be angry with him about? She was the one who was rejecting him this time. He took advantage of the moment, walking over to her as she slid pancakes onto a plate. Why are you so angry with me? Jess turned to him for a moment, absolutely dumbfounded. Are you really asking me that? As much as she loved him, sometimes the man seemed incredibly simple. He nodded. I am. I don't understand. You're leaving, and that's not breaking just one heart, but two. My heart is hurting just as much as yours is. She blinked at him in disbelief. I don't even know what to say to you any longer. Teddy Hughes. You're making my head hurt. She thrust the plate with pancakes and bacon at him. Better hurry and eat it before Nolan gets here. Did I hear my name? asked a voice from across the room. Nolan stopped and sniffed the air. Pancakes. My favorite. He walked over to Jess. You know, if Theodore doesn't want you, you could marry me. I'm not in love with you or anything, but if you kept cooking for me, it sure wouldn't take long. Jess smiled up at Nolan, shaking her head. 
I can't see myself marrying a man just because he might fall in love with me for my cooking one day. Nolan sighed, taking a plate of pancakes and bacon from her. It was worth a shot. He studied the pancakes for a moment, set his plate on the work table, and swept Jess into an embrace, kissing her cheek. You put raspberries in my pancakes. I think I am in love with you. Jess laughed, pushing Nolan away. Go eat, you bottomless pit of a man. Theodore wanted to scream in pain when he saw his friend hugging Jess, but he had no right to say a word. She wasn't his girl or even contemplating becoming his girl. Something had changed between them after she'd realized how remote the area was on Sunday, and he couldn't change his assignment. He would have to forget about her, which would be a lot easier once he was no longer looking at her for three meals per day. After breakfast, Theodore took the lunch Jess handed him, knowing she wouldn't be eating with him. Again. Why she was being so contrary, he had no idea. He'd done what his mother had suggested and tried to talk to her. When she'd acted like he should understand her problem without ever telling him what that problem was, it had been the last straw for him. He walked to the office, his head hanging. She was leaving tomorrow, and she was leaving angry with him. How on earth was he supposed to fight that? When he got to the office, he was surprised to see his four friends standing there, waiting for him. You're a fool, Joel said. She loves you. She wants to stay. All you have to do is ask her. He grabbed his lunch and left the office, his boots loud in the quiet office. Kendall took his turn next. Please ask her to stay. She makes you happy. Well, she makes all of us happy, but the rest of us aren't in love with her. And she doesn't love anyone but you. She must be blind. Then he was gone as well. Theodore took his seat, rubbing his hands over his face. He was surprised at the anger in Kendall's words. The younger man had always seemed to respect him. I suppose you two are going to tell me the same thing, he asked Elijah and Nolan. Nope, Nolan answered. I'm telling you now that if you don't ask that woman to stay, you'll be miserable for the rest of your life. And so will my stomach. She cooks extra for me. She's absolutely the most wonderful thing that has ever stepped foot in Squirrel Ridge Station. Don't let her go. Theodore sighed, his eyes going to Elijah. And you? What are you going to say? She's smart. She's funny. She's feisty. She's everything a man needs in a woman. And she's so beautiful. How are you not on your knees right this second, begging her to make you the happiest man alive? I promise you, if she goes, none of us are going to be fit to live with. Elijah plopped his hat on his head and left the building, obviously too upset to say more. Theodore rubbed his temples. They were all right. Every one of them. But how was he supposed to convince her to stay when she'd already made up her mind to go home? Jess had sweat popping out on her brow as she pulled a berry pie from the oven. That smells so good, Miss Hazel said as she walked into the room. Is that for supper tonight or is that for future suppers we won't be here to share? Oh, future suppers. I don't want any more happy memories that have Theodore involved, so I'm going to bake a coconut cake for dessert tonight. How will you not have a happy memory with coconut cake? Miss Hazel asked, obviously confused. I hate coconut, Jess said simply. So does Theodore, now that I think about it, Miss Hazel said. Oh, good. That's even better. Miss Hazel couldn't help but laugh. I shouldn't be happy that you're deliberately making something that my son hates, but I would do the same. I remember hoping my husband would choke on an apple pie once. Jess looked at Miss Hazel with surprise. Why? You know, I can't even remember now. He'd done some little thing that annoyed me, and I was angry with him. After he died, I quit remembering the little annoyances and only remembered how good he was to me. I wish I'd done that sooner. I'll always regret every minute I had with my husband when I was angry with him. I should talk to Teddy, shouldn't I? Jess dreaded it. She'd been very angry with him, and she didn't want to have to apologize. But she knew it was the right thing to do. I've thought you should for days now. You know that. Maybe after I finish the baking, I'll head over to the Mountie office. 
Miss Hazel smiled, clapping her hands. I can't believe you finally agreed. Theodore spent the morning trying to do the paperwork in front of him, but his mind wouldn't leave Jess. Just before lunchtime, he scrawled out a note for his Mountie buddies and left the office. He wasn't sure which of his other congregations the pastor was visiting this week, but he was going to track him down. He couldn't very well beg Jess to stay and marry him if he didn't have a pastor ready to perform the ceremony. When Jess got to the Mountie office that afternoon, she was surprised Theodore wasn't there. In his place was a note that said, I'll be back tomorrow. His signature was scrawled across the bottom. Jess read the note once more, and then put it back on the desk. She didn't know who it was meant for, but it obviously wasn't for her. She'd be gone shortly after he came back from wherever he'd gone. Dejectedly, she walked back to the cabin. She needed to get her things together and packed to go back to Ottawa anyway. Just before supper time, Joel strode into the cabin. Did Theodore tell you where he was going? He asked Jess. She shook her head. He didn't say anything to me about it. And that hurt, more than him simply not asking her to stay. He left without saying goodbye. Joel sighed. I don't know what's gotten into him lately. Miss Hazel looked up from her spot at the table, a book in front of her. I do. He's in love, and he has no idea how to behave. Jess made a face. If he was in love, he'd have told me by now. I've told him I love him. Truly, there wasn't a more contrary man in all of Canada. Joel studied Jess for a minute. Would you marry him if he asked? You don't know the answer to that question? Of course I'd marry him. I brought a wedding dress with me. Jess shrugged. It really doesn't matter at this point, though, does it? She would be alone for the rest of her life, always dreaming about Theodore. He was truly the only man she'd ever love. I guess not. The other three Mounties trickled in, and they all sat down to eat. After supper, Kendall smiled. I'm going to go get my guitar. We're going to give you a proper send-off, Jess. We'll all have a sing-along. Don't worry, no dancing. Jess was reluctant to agree, but if Teddy wouldn't be there, what difference did it make? She had to learn to have fun without him. It was late when she finally climbed under the covers that night. The night had been filled with song and laughter. Miss Hazel lay in the bed beside her. Do you think I'll ever be able to move on? Jess asked softly. I never could. I don't exactly have suitors beating down my door at my age, but I wouldn't have accepted a bow. Teddy's father was the only man I've ever loved. I can't imagine kissing another, let alone being married to someone else. You were supposed to encourage me. Tell me that I will find someone else to love. More than anything, Jess needed someone to tell her she wouldn't always be alone, because at the moment, that's where she felt like she was headed. Miss Hazel sighed heavily. I won't lie to you, Jess. I've seen you with Teddy. You two are, well, I believe he's the love of your life and you're the love of his. Maybe he'll come to his senses and ride into Ottawa on his big horse his scarlet uniform looking majestic as he rides. He'll ride right up to you on the street, pull you onto his horse, and insist you ride off into the sunset with him. Jess laughed softly. Miss Hazel? You are the most romantic woman I've ever met. You need to find something to do that will let you show that side of yourself. Maybe I will. There were only four Mounties for breakfast on Thursday morning, and Jess had cooked for six. That was good, because Nolan declared himself more peckish than usual and made short work of the extra food. Jess felt her heart sink even more when she realized Theodore wasn't even going to be there for goodbyes. It was strange that he wouldn't even say goodbye to his own mother, but what could she say? Everyone had been commenting on how strangely he was behaving of late. After breakfast, she cleaned up the breakfast dishes and swept the floor. She wanted to make sure everything was in place when they left because she wasn't about to make his life any harder than it already was. In a few days, all signs of her and his mother being there would be gone. Just before lunchtime, she decided to go pick a few more berries and bake some muffins before the train arrived. One last act of love waiting for him when he got home. 
She carried one pail with her as she walked out to the berry patch that was almost completely devoid of berries now. Every day she'd picked a few more for jam, pies, or muffins. She'd never seen a man who loved muffins quite the way Teddy did. She picked a bucket full and hurried back to the cabin. Her train left at two, and it was already afternoon. She wanted him to come home to fresh-baked muffins, filling the air with their fragrance. Miss Hazel watched her as she rushed to bake the muffins, shaking her head. You can't not do kind things for my boy, even when you're angry with him. Oh, Jess, I wish I could call you daughter. I wish you could too, Miss Hazel, but that's not the way things are turning out. No matter. I'll move on with my life, and he'll move on with his. Someday he'll find a woman who he wants to marry. It just won't be me. Chapter 10 Jess and Miss Hazel left for the train station as soon as the muffins were ready. It was a short walk, and Jess was glad she'd decided to have the bulk of her belongings shipped later, instead of bringing a trunk with her. It wasn't a big deal to carry her small suitcase the short distance. She sat on the only bench in the station beside Miss Hazel, neither of them as talkative as usual. When the train pulled into the station, she took a deep breath and stood up. She knew that a piece of her heart would forever be in this small town, with Theodore. She was walking toward the train, and she heard her name being called as if from a distance. She looked at Miss Hazel questioningly before she turned. There was Teddy, riding toward her. Jessica, wait. Jess put her suitcase down, worried she'd miss her train. When he was close, he all but vaulted off his horse, stopping in front of her. Don't go. Don't go? But I thought you wanted me to go. Jess studied his face, trying to understand what he wanted from her. Two days ago, his words would have made all the difference. Where have you been? She couldn't just agree to stay without knowing why he'd disappeared, though she wanted to scream she'd stay with him forever. He was looking for me, came another voice from behind Teddy. She hadn't looked at anything but him, her eyes trying to memorize every line of his face. She'd draw him and exorcise him from her mind. It might keep her from going insane with missing him. Jess looked at the man behind him, at first not recognizing him, but then she realized who he was. The pastor who had preached on Sunday. Why was he looking for you, pastor? Her brows were drawn together in confusion. Teddy took her hand, pulling her off the platform. I'll bring her right back, Mom. Miss Hazel was grinning from ear to ear. Oh, I have a feeling you need her a great deal more than I do, son. Jess followed him around the side of the train station, before she dug in her heels. Exactly where are you taking me? He was dragging her around like she was a rag doll, and he had to know that wouldn't set well with her. I guess this is good enough. He cleared his throat, thinking of all the speeches he'd practiced for the past twenty-four hours as he'd searched all three towns before finding the pastor in his home which was near the first town he'd searched. I realized yesterday that I had to stop being noble. I've given you every reason in the world to think that I don't want you here, but the truth is, I need you, Jessica. Please stay here with me as my wife. Jess blinked a couple of times. Why? She knew it wasn't the right answer to a marriage proposal, but her mind was spinning. Did he only want her to cook for him? Why the sudden change of mind? Because I love you. I go to bed at night, and I see your face as I close my eyes. I wake up in the morning, and you're the first thought that enters my mind. I want you to be happy, and with no women around for friendship, I know that may be hard. Amount as hours can be long, and you may be alone more than you'd like. He closed his eyes. I'm giving you all the reasons you should say no, and that's not very bright of me. I love you and I want to wake up with your head on the pillow next to mine every single morning. Please, say you'll stay and marry me. Jess watched absently as her train pulled out of the station. A slow smile crossed her face. Well, I guess I have to stay now, because I just missed my train. He grinned, pulling her into his arms and kissing her. I could lie to you and promise I'll make sure you get on next week's train, but I'm keeping you. Her arms wound around his neck and she looked into his eyes. I want you to keep me. There's nothing more I want in this entire world. He crushed his lips to hers, holding her close. 
There's a pastor over there, probably wondering if we're ever going to come back. Will you marry me? Right now? Jess nodded emphatically. I thought you'd never ask. I thought you wanted to go back to Ottawa after you saw there were no women here. I told you that I would be happy as long as I could spend the rest of my life with you. Did he ever listen to anything she said? I can see there were misunderstandings. But you'll marry me now? Of course, I will. Let's go talk to the pastor. What's his name, anyway? Teddy wrapped his arm around her shoulders and steered her back toward the train platform where his mother and the pastor waited for him. Where's your mom going to stay for the next week? she asked. I'm sure Kendall and Elijah will share a cabin for a week. Or something like that. I haven't thought that far ahead. I just needed to get the preacher here so I could marry you, and you wouldn't leave me. You could have asked me to marry you and then gone for the pastor, that would have been all right. Jess couldn't believe he'd let her worry for an extra twenty-four hours when he could have put her mind at ease. He shrugged. It seemed smarter this way. What would you have done if I'd said no? I guess I'd have taken him back to his house. I'm glad I don't have to figure it out. The pastor looked between Jess and Theodore. Are you ready to marry now? Jess frowned. I brought a dress to marry in, and I'd like for the other Mounties to be there. Can we get married this evening? Theodore nodded, seeming reluctant. You're not asking me to wait so you can run away, are you? He was so afraid she was going to leave him there alone. She laughed. No, that's not what I'm doing at all. I just have a pretty dress that will need to be pressed before I can wear it, and I'd really like for your friends to be there. I feel like they're my friends now too. Oh, they are. Teddy smiled at his mom. You're going to have to go back to Ottawa by yourself. I'm keeping her. I'm so relieved. Miss Hazel said, hugging him tightly. Relieved? Why are you relieved? Theodore asked, confused, because I thought my only child didn't have the brains God gave a goat. Now I know you're not stupid, after all. He laughed, shaking his head. My mother has so much confidence in me. Makes me feel good. He turned to Pastor Robert Wilson. Would you mind waiting for the other Mounties to get back to town for the day? You wouldn't be able to ride out until seven or so. The pastor shrugged. I can stay here for the night if there's cake involved. He looked at Jess. I've heard marvelous things about your cooking, young lady. Is there cake involved? Jess laughed out loud, truly happy for the first time in days. I think Miss Hazel and I can make a cake happen pretty quickly. Then I'm staying the night. You ladies, hurry off and get ready for this wedding. I'm ready for cake. The pastor rubbed his hands together. Theodore smiled at Jess. Yes, you two go get ready. The other Mounties will be back in about two hours. Could you meet me at the church then? Jess nodded. We're off to bake a cake and get ready for a wedding. Theodore picked up both suitcases and carried them toward his cabin. Is this all you brought? he asked. Miss Hazel suggested I wait to have her ship the rest of my things out after we married. I didn't understand it at the time, but I sure do now. Jess looked at Miss Hazel, who had an innocent look on her face. Where am I going to stay this week? Miss Hazel asked. I know I'm not staying in the newlywed cabin. Jess blushed as Teddy hurried to answer the question. I'll ask Nolan to share with Joel, I think. Joel will do it because we've been friends for a long time, and Nolan will do it because he knows he'll get good food out of it. I'm not sure which of the men is neater, so you'll have to determine that. We can still have all our meals in your cabin, Miss Hazel said. You'll have to work every day, so I don't think any of us can pretend this is a real honeymoon. Theodore shrugged, pushing open the door. He didn't really care if everyone ate with them, as long as they left after the meal. He stopped short just inside and dropped both suitcases, turning to Jess. Even though you felt rejected by me, you made me muffins before leaving to go back to Ottawa. She nodded. I wanted you to think of me after I was gone. How could I ever stop? He took two muffins, kissed her cheek, and left the cabin, closing the door behind him. 
Jess looked at Miss Hazel, a look of panic entering her eyes. We have a lot to do, and not much time. I'll start on the cake. You get your dress ready. Jess hurried to open her suitcase and air out her dress. She'd had it laid out most of the week, hoping that it would be worn, but she'd packed it the day before. It was a bit wrinkled, but nothing that a quick press with an iron wouldn't fix. She went into the bedroom and laid it on the bed before hurrying out to Miss Hazel. I'm going to fill the bathtub and wash my hair. Oh, do you think you have time? With as long as your hair is, I don't think there's any way it'll be dry before the Mounties get back from work. Jess frowned. I want to look my best. Miss Hazel looked at Jess, obviously thinking. Why don't I style it? There's a pretty hairstyle that was all the rage when I was younger, and I've never seen you wear it that way. I could hurry out back and cut some flowers to add to it. Oh, yes, please, Miss Hazel, hurry and get the cake in the oven, and then you can start on my hair. Jess stood for a moment, wondering what she should do next. She hurried and put the iron on the stove, deciding that pressing her dress was the most important thing at the moment. Two hours later, Jess was ready. Her dress was a simple white day dress, and she had a white hat with lace hanging down on both sides of her face. It may not be the fancy dress she'd have worn if she'd married back in Ottawa, but she still felt she looked her very best. The white leather slippers she wore would be dirty by the time she reached the church, but that was to be expected when you married in a place that didn't have proper streets. As she walked alongside Miss Hazel, she sighed contentedly. This is what I thought we'd do as soon as we got to town. I still can't believe you tricked us both the way you did. All's well, that ends well. Miss Hazel said, happy as a clam. I should find wives for the other Mounties here, don't you think? No, Miss Hazel, promise me you won't do that unless they ask you to. Jess didn't want the kind of confusion that would come from more women showing up expecting to marry when there were no men planning to marry them. Miss Hazel frowned. It worked out so well this time. Not for me. Not for Theodore. We had a very rough week. I know. All right. I won't find them brides unless they ask me to. Do you think they'll ask me to? Jess had to laugh. I'm sure if you can find a chef willing to marry Nolan, he'll accept her on the spot. I'm sure he would. Well, you talk to them and get them to ask me to find them brides. Then you'll have friends. How about we think about one wedding at a time? They had arrived at the church, and Jess stood at the back. Miss Hazel walked down the aisle in front of her. She'd insisted that it was necessary, because she was both the matron of honor and the mother of the groom. As Jess watched her go, she thought about how much her life had changed in just six short weeks. Miss Hazel had taken her from her boring existence and brought her to the point where she was truly happy as she married the only man she'd ever loved. Slowly she walked toward the front of the church, her eyes on Theodore. He looked so sharp in his mounty uniform, and she realized it was the only thing she'd seen him wear since she'd arrived in Squirrel Ridge Station. When she got to the front of the church, he reached out and took her hand, and they both gave all their attention to the preacher. Not twenty minutes later, They'd been declared husband and wife, and Teddy pulled her into his arms, kissing her in a way that made her toes curl. Now you can't go anywhere, he whispered. I never wanted to be anywhere but here. Back at his cabin, Miss Hazel served the stew Jess had made for their supper when she'd been cooking on Wednesday. There was enough for everyone, because Miss Hazel had made biscuits to go along with it. Otherwise, Nolan never would have let part of his share go to the pastor. Jessica and Teddy cut the cake together, laughing as they fed each other small bites. It felt so strange to eat from a man's fingers. She had a feeling many things would seem odd as she got used to being newly married. At the end of the night, it was decided that Miss Hazel would stay in Joel's cabin, and Joel would move in with Nolan for the week. Nolan hadn't liked the idea of losing his privacy until he'd realized it meant food. Then he was fine with it. After everyone had gone, Jess sat with Teddy in the backyard, looking up at the stars. I'm going to miss your mom being around. She certainly keeps things interesting, that she does. He took her hand and pressed it to his lips. I promise you from this day forward that I won't try to guess what you want in life. 
I'll ask you. I may still make some decisions that upset you, but you have every right to tell me how you feel about things as well. Jess smiled, resting her head against his shoulder. I'm so glad you caught me before I got on that train. Me too. I wasn't looking forward to having to go all the way to Ottawa to drag you back. Drag, she asked with a grin. Beg you to return with me? I like that so much better. Epilogue, September 15, 1910 Dear Miss Hazel, I've talked to the Mounties, and they're all in agreement. They want you to send them brides. You might as well just train four at once, so they can all travel together. It will be safer than sending them off individually. Being married to your son brings a smile to my face every single day, and though I don't agree with how you got us to marry, I thank God every single day for your interference in my life. I didn't realize this much happiness was even possible. If you're going to send brides for the Mounties, try to talk to my friends Joanne and Lisa. If one or both of them could come out here, I would be the happiest woman alive. I do find myself lonely for female companionship during the long days while the men are out on patrol, but I just keep telling myself that it's worth it to be with my Theodore every day. Teddy sends you his love. Your favorite daughter. Jess Hughes. P.S. I love signing my whole name. Jess Hughes sounds so much better than Jess Sanderson. Don't you think?